Good job. We now call 21-38410, the state of Texas versus Clayton Foreman. The defendant is present with his attorney and the state's attorney. So we're ready to proceed state. Yes, Your Honor. And defense. Yes. And I believe Mr. Best is on the stand for cross-examination. So please bring the jury in. Thank you, Davis. <laughs> I can't see. It is when you're not around. you're not around, you keep the I'm sorry. Well, <laughs> So I didn't like that. But it's fine. It's definitely it's in South Park. That's it. Not a secret. Best thing to do. It's not. But it's a rainbow. So I have to let. Yeah. It's very old. It's fine. It's just. Can you um, it's just brown, mm -hmm. it looks like a peach gas here. Kind of, it's covered. Black or dark color? Brown, it's just brown. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, yeah. Then now, so we had an ass for six years, so it's kind of good. Yeah. But it looks good. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then, what's it doing? It's a kind of, you know, we couldn't have a safety book. I know the association wouldn't let us change.
The record count for the degree is seated in the courtroom. All parties are present. We are ready to proceed. I believe when we vote, you had rested or did you have more questions? We did, but I talked to Ms. Burbank before. I had a couple more points I wanted to make before I passed, if that's all right. You, you may. Right. May I approach the witness, Sean? Yes, sir. Previously, when we were talking about the exhibits that you exhibited, the that you took, that had no sense to you. You took states 109 and its contents, or 109A and its contents, to the UCDPS from office. You indicated that the outside package, which is 109A, is the package they asked you to, the UCDPS asked you to put 109 and its contents in and seal it with signatures on the back. Yes, sir. Correct. You had previously been taken 109 and its contents, which includes 109C and 109C1, 109B, and 109B1 were contained within 109. Is that correct? Yes, sir. And that was sealed when we received it. Yes. And it was sealed when we delivered it to the Houston DPS crime lab. It was. Yes, sir. You did not open it at all or tamper with it in any way, shape, or no, sir. Okay. And then it states 110, which was the uh, Evidence that you took the anal swabs that you took from the Austin crime lab to the Houston crime lab, and that is on the outside, it states 110B and 110A. It came in the package of 110B sealed. Is that correct? Yes, sir. That is correct. And did you ever open or tamper with anything that was contained within 110B? No, sir. No. no. So you received it from the Austin Crime Lab sealed and you delivered it to the Houston EPS Crime Lab sealed. Yes. That's all gone. Pass the weeks. Oh, okay. <clears throat> well, After you talk to me, I got quite questions now. Yes. All right. Um, do you know how my approach says? You may. Do you know how it has been marked as 110 being got to the Austin crime lab before? The initial transport to Austin yeah. from, say, Beaumont? Well, you said you said that you picked it up in Austin or to bring to Houston? Yes. Do you know how it got to Austin? I do not you recall it, if at all, no, sir. And do you know what's contained in there, roughly? I mean, do, do, are they all labeled what's in here? I guess that's the A number, right? Yes, corresponding with the, the documents. And then this, which is states exhibit, Mark the states exhibit uh, 109A, and it contains 109 that yes, they went through. Uh, these are things that were taken from offering. They went. They went through the process of offering at one point. Okay. Yes. Did you bring them to offering originally? Mm -hmm. well, I brought those or moved those from offering to back to Houston. I don't recall much further exactly. How they got to Austin would have been one of three ways, or one of a couple of ways. I should say either myself, Detective Llewellyn, or even mail is accepted, U.S. mail or FedEx, or um, could have been could have been any of those ways that it got from Austin to Austin. And the date you went up to Ohio to interview, what date was that? That was April 29th, 2021. Yes, sir. And the date you picked these up. Nineteen? Yes, sir. That is perfect. Not the nineteenth. Yes. The seized. So the record. Uh, yeah. That is. That would be. You didn't do. 
I'm looking at states exhibit 110 and states 109 or mm -hmm. um, state uh, mark dash. Yes, sir. Um, one was, but well, you didn't do both of them. No, I think two years apart, as a matter of fact. So the offer was April 19th? Yes, sir. Of 21? Yes, sir. And that's how exhibit 110. Yes, yes, sir. That no, that, that's 109. That's 109, I guess so. Yes. Then let me put this hand back over to this hand. Yes. 19. 109 was from Austin to Houston. 110 was from off to Houston. Yeah, no. 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 Uh, he testified before 109 was from off to Houston and 21. And 110 is from Austin Crown Lab to Houston UBS Crown Lab in 23. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes, sir. Thank no, you there, Mr. Cut out. I was trying to be helpful. I wasn't trying to. I know. Yeah, I was trying to help. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Anything else? No, Your Honor, may this witness be excused. You are excused, sir. Thank, Thank you, Judge. Thank you, Jerry, very much for your service. Next witness, please. Oh, Detective Aaron Llewellyn. Okay. Raise your right hand, please, sir. You solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony that you are about to give shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So go. Exactly. And please have a seat. Thank you. You take the name for the jury, please. Aaron, hello. And how are you employed? I'm detective at the city ball. How long have you worked for them? 26 years. And right now, what are your current duties with Beaumont Police Department? I'm a detective assigned to the Crimes Against Persons Unit. And for the past four years, I've been assigned to our six Breach Task Force and the Task Force Officer of the Federal FBI Office. Back on April 2020, were you a detective with the Beaumont First Department? I was. Now, let, let's kind of give the jury a little background. When when you were working for the Beaumont Police Department, you always weren't in crimes against persons, were you? Yes, sir. Before that, what were you in? I was in crimes against property. Mm -hmm. And while you were in crimes against property, uh, did you have some downtime? I did. And what did you do in your downtime? So back when I worked at Crime Against Property, uh, like I said, I had a lot of downtime. So I researched every homicide that Beaumont PD had. And from that list, or from that information, I created a list of cold cases. What was the purpose of looking at the cold cases? I don't see if there's anything else that we can do to bring justice to them. Was one of those involving a victim with the name of Mary Catherine Edwards? It was. Now, when you first saw that case, did you want to get involved in it? At the time, no. It was rather extensive. My duties, you know, maybe were different cases, and it wasn't necessarily my purpose to get involved in that. Uh, but from that information, I was able to create that list and give it to the, the person who did it at the time so they could delve into those cases. 
So then you got into persons. Is that correct? And how long was it that you were in persons before you decided to give another look at Mary Catherine Edwards' case? During my, I went to persons in 2010, and during that, I, I worked some other cold cases uh, and had some success with them. And then in 2014 or 15, I met Ranger Bass, and we worked some cases together to get approaching again in 2015. So he came to you in 2020. Was he looking for that specific case, or was he just looking for a cold case to see if there was something he could help out with? For a cold case, he recently come up with an investigation that was in Seabrook, where they did very similar investigative techniques that we used and had some success, but their suspect had already passed away. So the techniques that he was using at that time, what was it he was looking to use? Genetic gene knowledge. Had you been familiar with genetic genealogy before that was brought up? I was. I followed the Golden State Killer case and been in the news and watched it and had a cursory understanding of it. Did you think it might be helpful in this case? When he first approached me, he asked if we had any cases that he felt that I felt like this would work in. I said, absolutely. It's the first one that came to mind. Okay. Well, let's talk about um, what the, the first step was in April of 2020 that, that you needed to do to get this case looked at again. Okay, so originally I pulled up the case file, which is I think six boxes of, of a banker box full of paperwork. Started going through that. It had the, the misfortune of crossing three different record keeping systems from the old analog carbon copies to more computerized stuff these days and organizing and learning the case. So, so how long did that take you to organize the, the file? A couple of weeks. Now, when you're when you're organizing and looking at it, do you have to go through pretty much every piece of paper there is in the file? Yes. And just about every property record there is? Yes. And did you determine what evidence was left over from this case that might be kind of beneficial to looking at? Yes. What was it that you thought might be beneficial for a laboratory to look at to try to do the genetic genealogy? Oh, without a doubt, I mean, biological uh, evidence left behind. What about blood, uh, swabs, things of that nature. Yeah. At, at that time, had this file already been to uh, several, a few laboratories, a couple of laboratories anyway? So we have our local lab, FBI lab, and so on. The ones that I remember I'm talking to. Had anything gone to the Austin Crime Lab at that time? Yes. Okay. Had a profile been developed? Yes. So looking at what you had, did y'all approach Otham? Yes. You just call and do you have to go through an application process? Well, there's a an online process where you send them case information, what you're looking for, and then they will develop, you know, do their science beyond that. Uh, Ranger Bess had met with me and told me that he recently met her off with that other case that he'd work. And then we met with Mr. Middleman and kind of presented what we had. And he said, absolutely, I think we can help you. And we just went through there to take process. Okay. I need you to slow down just a little bit. I can see the court reporter. He's starting to smoke's coming out of here. So um, you, you all spoke with Mr. Middleman. Yes. Um, same Middleman that testified earlier here in this trial. Yes. Did you all start getting some samples to take to him? We did. Okay. Do you remember what samples were taken to Awesome Laboratories? If you're talking about from the crime scene, it was uh, uh, cutting some comfort early. Cutting some of the comforter, were there any the vaginal swabs taken also? Do you know? Okay. After getting those, now you didn't take those, did you? No. Who took those? Ranger goods. All right. So from that was a profile developed from Othram using their technology. Yes. And do you know what happened to that profile? I entered into a program called GEDmatch. Now, are you familiar with GEDmatch? Yes. Have you become more familiar with GEDmatch? Yes, sir. Uh, we've heard the, the description of GEDmatch. Were some names given off of GEDmatch that uh, were potential matches to, or not matches, but potential family members of the uh, biologicals that were from the crime scene? Yes, we were given some distant relatives that were related to the biological sample that was jumping off the start of investigation. Now, we've heard from uh, Cheryl LaPointe and your wife, Kena Llewellyn, about their process of how they began to research and use those uh, biologicals that were tested. What was your role during the, the genealogical process? When this first started, <clears throat> me, I was given the names 
and started working for genealogy myself. Uh, I'm kind of a visual learner, so when it grew beyond my computer screen, it was a little bit confusing to me. Uh, my wife had already had some uh, experience with working genealogy and things like that. So quickly became a moment of, okay, move over Virginia, let me help. So she would start helping me work this tree, and in between that, she would come up with names, and I would help her do the research, checking death records or open source records and different databases that we had access to. What about if we needed to have somebody swab to be tested? What was your duty then? Well, once we came up with a potential target, I mean, a target by somebody that might be closer related to our, our suspect, uh, myself and uh, Ranger Best would travel the state and go knock on people's doors and try to talk them out of their DNA. So, doing that, do, do you remember about how many people y'all talked to to try to get DNA from? We got around 40 samples. Some of them were direct uh, buccal swabs. Some of them were people who had already tested through the other uh, commercial genealogy companies, and they provided us with their, their digital kits. So there was, a, in your report, there was a list of names, about 30 names. Were those the people that voluntarily gave up yes. DNA or just gave up their profiles and DNA? Both. Both. Now, the profiles, when you when you talk about getting those, what, what would they give you as far as the, the profiles? What would they do? They'd email us their kit that they'd gotten from whichever commercial company. Would be. So... Then share our keynote would enter that into the GEDmatch profile. No, we did that to Awesome. Okay. So Awesome entered it in GEDmatch. Yes. How how often did y'all do that with with Awesome before y'all took over? <laughs> yeah. Well, at some point, Awesome just started providing just samples and, and didn't do the genealogical research. Right? Were they doing any genealogical research in the beginning? They gave us information, and then it was as detectives we had to. The, the spare time to, to get engaged with it and get the ball rolling. Okay. At some point, did the research just become Tina and Shara? Yes. And how long was that before a suspect was discovered? 87 days. And in that 87 days, were you out getting buckle swabs and doing research for them? Yes. Uh, were you kind of like the hands and feet? Yes. Uh, so at one point, you get a profile that is a close relative of a suspect. Is that right? I won't say it was actually a close relative, but it was a relative that was able to eliminate the rest of the family line and give us a potential of two brothers. Okay. So looking at both brothers, looking at their where they're living, their past, everything else, did you focus in on one individual? We did. And who is that? Clayton. And do you see Clayton Foreman in the courtroom? I do. Can you point to him, describe an article of clothing he's wearing? It's the man that's wearing a shirt. Record reflect he's identified the defendant? Yes, it will. So when a suspect was developed, what was your first thought in how to get the next step to try to figure out if you had the right person? What kind of research, Mr. Foreman, we knew that he didn't live in Texas. So through my position at the FBI, I sent what's known as a lead to the Cincinnati field office and put them to basically do a trash run. Okay. Let's explain what a trash run is. What is a trash run? Once somebody puts their trash out to the curb, it becomes basically public domain. We have to do to see that for evidentiary purposes. Okay. You're starting to speed up again. <laughs> <laughs> if I can hear it, I know she's having trouble typing it. So, um, so trash run... Somebody leaves the trash out. Somebody goes by. One of the officers goes by and takes the trash. Is that right? right. And you're trying to gather evidence. Yes. Okay. Was that done in this case? It was. And that trash run, who ran that trash run? I don't know the detectives. I thought somebody from the Reynoldsburg Police Department. Yes. And they started with G or something. Gamble? Okay. Now, when they, when they went, did they take a couple of bags, and then did you eventually get those bags? I did. How did you do? They were sent to the local FBI office. And contained in those bags, were there some things like dental floss, forks, spoons, things that you can get DNA, possibly DNA off of you. And was that, in fact, sent to you? It was. Let me show you some photographs. 
Did you see the contents that were contained in there? Before you sent them off? Yes. All right, let's see. Let's start with this. Look at States Exhibits 140. Or is that in there? 150. See if I look to make a Look familiar? Yes, sir. The state to give it one forty minutes with just like over the fence. Yeah, I How did you receive this this trash pool? Do you remember? It was shipped to the local FBI office. Okay. Do they have their own way that they get things from point A to point B? Yes. And so it got to you pretty quick, didn't it? Yes, sir. So looking at State Exhibit 140, that looked like the trash bag that you received. It does. And the tag on 141, that says the trash from the curb, doesn't it? Yes, it does. Um, when you open this, let's do 142. When you open these up and you got the items out, how could you decide what you needed to take to the lab? Did you talk to the lab or did you just decide? I talked to Tanya and gave her a rundown of the things that we found and she suggested the best items for that. And do you remember what you took to Tanya Dean at the lab report? It's okay if you don't. I think I have a form. I don't recall all of them. I remember we sent the, the plastic bird. Let me show you. Let's see. Well, let's mark this. Thanks, Exhibit 152. Let's see if that looks familiar. Okay. And what is that? It's the lab's in the report that I filled out once I did my evidence to Okay. So you filled it out and you signed it. Is that correct? Yes. And what date was that that you turned it in? April 21st of 2020. When was the trash run? Do you remember? Let me show, let me tender states a good one from the That's trash man. No objection to. So out of this, hold on. Hey, hold on. Been already in. There, yeah, there's a oh there one already in? I'm sorry, Judge. It's 151, That number is number 152. Yes, sir. Is there a 152? There is. It's hidden somewhere here. Let me see. Let me see. This is Bex. This is Bex. I mean, think he said he called it 150. No, uh, you had a block of states exhibits 140 through 150 through uh, Tom Gill. Yes, I sir. Don't... I think a while ago, when whenever Matt was questioning Ranger Bess, there may have been a mix up of what he called one of the exhibits. You may have read it wrong. Just recently this morning. You see anything higher than 150? Yeah, 155. There's 151 is right here. Though. <laughs> It wasn't admitted, I don't think. Well, I'm pretty good about writing this down. She is, I know she is. Okay. Right. So there's no 152? Okay. 
So I you know, tender one fifty two since there's not one. Okay. And you are yes, sir. marking that as states exhibit one fifty two. Yes, sir. It's been tendered over to the defendant. Yes, sir. He said okay. without objection, then it is admitted. Okay. So let's look at states exhibit 152 and see what it is that you took in for. It says black and gray hair samples. Is that correct? So look at 144. Does that appear to be the black and gray hair samples? Yes, sir. Next is an envelope discovery bill. Yes, sir. And at 150, that appeared to be the discovery bill, discovery bill for Dr. Corman. Yes. A little bit further down is two plastic spoons. Yes, sir. Look at state 145. What does that appear to be? Two plastic spoons. Okay. On the second page, we've got a string of dental floss. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Look at 146. What does that appear to be? Dental floss. Next is one plastic fork. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Look at states 147. What does that appear to be? Plastic fork. <laughs> And then last but not least, what is the last one? Five prescription bottles. And looking at states 148, does that appear to be five plastic prescription bottles? Yes, sir. So these were the items that were taken to Tanya D at the Houston Crime Lab. Is that correct? Correct. If I were to tell you that all those items have been admitted into evidence, would you agree with me that everything in those pictures would be contained in these exhibits? Yes, sir. If they have not been opened. Um, let's start off with that. So I'm gonna 113A. What does 113A say it is? Hair trash pool. Okay, so that's that black and gray hair, is that correct? Yes, sir. And 113B, what is that? For trash pool. Okay. Find the right one. Mm -hmm. 113C, what is that? This is all trash pool. Okay. And 113. Ah. What is that? Spoon trash pool. And 113D. Spoon trash pool. So that adds up to the two spoons, is that correct? 113F. Dental floss trash pool. That's the dental floss we saw. <laughs> and 113G. Spoon trash pool. And what is 113H? Male trash pool. So that would be that discovery bill, is that correct? Yes, sir. Okay. So everything that's been entered in is what you took to find your name. Is that correct? And that was on April 21st of 2021. Correct. Now, when you took them, did when you got them, did you place them in those envelopes and seal them up, or did somebody else? Were they sealed when you got them? Were they sealed when you took them there? Yes. Now, at before all this, we're going to do a little history on the case, but before all this, was there ever any Clayton Foreman anywhere inside the, the realm of possibilities as far as a suspect? No. So was any lab testing anything about Clayton Foreman in relation to this case? All they were testing was a sample that had an unknown substance on it, right? Or a semen on it. Yes. And didn't know who that suspect was. Yes. So when this trash can search was pulled, the purpose was to try to tie 
those samples that had no suspect attached to them to what this trash can pull was. Is that right? Correct. So Tanya Dean was the one who tested all that. Is that right? Yes. And after testing that, were you pretty clear about who your suspect was? Yes. And did you obtain an arrest warrant? Yes. And after y'all, I we've seen the statements. Y'all went to talk to him in Ohio. Is that correct? Correct. And talked to Clayton Foreman for about an hour. Is that right? Yes. Sir. And then afterwards, he was arrested. Is that right? He was. And did you take a get a search warrant and get a swab from him so that you could test him instead of just his track? Move. Let me show you what's marked as States Exhibit 118A. See if you recognize that you put the tag on it. Yes, sir. And the contents, you look inside and see if you recognize it. Those are beautiful swabs that I took from Clayton Foreman. And when did you take those? Do you remember? Does it have a date on it that you picked those swabs? Look inside. Okay. January 20th, 21. And do you take those personally from him? I did. And what did you do with them once that you took those swabs? Took them around. Did you place them back in the box? Yes. And put your initials on them? Yes, sir. And did you seal them up? Yes. In this envelope, or did somebody else seal them in this envelope? Excellent. You took the boxes? Yes. And so with the boxes closed, you drove them straight to the Houston County Lab? Yes. Is that correct? And did you turn them into Tommy D? I turned them into the insect of the DPS lab. Okay. So when you took those, did you also take some blood from the victim with you? Yes. Let me show you what's marked 34 C. That appears to be the victim's blood that you took with you to the crime lab. Yes. And looking at State's Exhibit 153, you recognize that document. I do. What is that document? It's the lab submitted for the DPS using the lab for the new response and victim's blood. Okay. And that's the same that you just identified in States Exhibits uh, 34C and the contents of 118A. Is that right? Correct. You took those to the crime lab. And is this your handwriting that filled this form out? Yes, sir. And your signature on it? Yes, sir. And the date you took it? Correct. Finger space 153. No objection, states conflict. It's admitted. Now, this blood that you got is did you get it from the Fallmont Police Department to take to the history crime lab, of course? And was it being stored there in the, the Fallmont Police Department in a sealed condition? It wasn't. And so when you took it, you took it and dropped it off in a sealed condition. Is that correct? Now they wouldn't accept it if it wasn't in a sealed condition. Is that right? Um Trying to get all the bad stuff out of the way real fast. Later on, let, let's let's just go back and do a little history first. Um, then we'll get to the present day. When you first picked this up and started looking at it, did you go through the, the investigation that was conducted? I did. And I, th I think you put in your paperwork that it was an exhaustive investigation, right? So, what do you mean by exhaustive investigation? During the early days of this investigation, the paper focused on Catherine's inner circle trying to develop the suspect. As time passed and those uh, leads ran out, they started kind of expanding their net, trying to find other people uh, to develop other suspects for leads to help solve this case. Uh, and that list of people grew and grew and grew uh, to the point where they would even contact local, not local agencies, but neighboring agencies that may have a similar crime and then contact those agencies to send them. Uh, their lab numbers so they can compare the DNA in those cases of blood. 
Well, you're working in your experience as a detective when you have a murder and sexual assault such as this. Is it normal to focus on people close to her first? Just kind of see who's 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 close and who has access to her, right? Correct. And is it okay to expand it out to even people that are around the area that are like acquaintances, uh, get a little bit further out from that inner circle? Yes. How far do you expand it? As far as you need to? Until the leads quit running out. You know, they worked on so many leads in the early days. But people that came into contact with Kath, I mean, they're uh, socially or professionally, uh, even going back years to, to contact people that she knew from school and things like that. Were they even at the point to where they were checking out rumors? That yeah. they, I mean, they they checked every little thing they could think of, right? Yes. They even tested people, didn't they, for DNA? They did. About how many people do you remember them, or did you notice in the investigation testing for DNA to rule them out? There are around 30 different people that gave samples of either hair or blood or beautiful swabs to compare the evidence. That's a lot of people. It is. Um, in a way, does it help when you pick it up as a cold case to see that they've eliminated a lot of people through DNA? It did. This case, it wasn't that they failed to solve it. They just found 30 some odd people who weren't the suspect. And because they were so exhausted and laid a foundation investigated and worked that we could really use that as a jumping off point rather than trying to reinvent the loop. Matter of fact, you found one person that they couldn't test because he was deceased, right? By the name of Hebert? Correct. And how did you resolve that problem? We found a niece and got her to do a, a DNA sample to do genetic genealogy on a clear him. Okay. So we cleared those 30 people, and then when we got to the family members and did the genealogy, we cleared how many more people? 40. So all these people that were tested by DNA were cleared, and then as they were cleared, it started pointing towards one person, didn't it? Correct. Now, did you also look and see if there were any ties as far as knowing the person or being around the person who is deceased or uh, having any social connection with this person who is in Ohio. Yes. And did you find out that there were some ties to Clayton Foreman with the victim, in this case, Mary Catherine Edwards? Yes. What were the ties that you remember? They attended high school together, and Catherine and her sister Allison were also his first wife, his wife. Now, did you check to see if they'd had any other social interactions between the time of, of them going to high school until the time that you found him in Ohio? Yeah. And what did you discover? Originally, I spoke to uh, Allison. They knew them from high school. They were in the living house. The living experience over time. I also went through all the different case files. I found a box. Uh, it had been taken from the crime scene. And it was, uh, I guess, memorabilia of Catherine's letters, journals, uh, birthday cards, just a whole bunch of stuff that she kept throughout the years uh, as memories. And I went through that looking for any reference to Clayton Foreman. And did you find any? I found one letter with the name Clayton that was from his first wife, Diana, prior to their wedding to Catherine. He just mentioned him in passing. There was no other mention of him in any of the journals, diaries, or cards or anything. So the fact that they did not have any social interactions, the fact that she doesn't mention having any contact with him and him denying any contact, is there any reason other than the crime itself for his DNA to be with her, in her, or on her uh, bedspread? No. So as you went through your investigation looking at the way this crime was committed. Let's talk about the crime scene itself. What did you notice about the crime scene itself as far as uh, whether or not the doors were locked or there was forced entry, other things of that nature that you look at as a detective? There was no forced entry indicating that uh, either she opened the door for someone that she knew or someone that she could trust or someone that uh, proposed a position of authority that she could trust. Okay. What else did you notice? Was the downstairs disrupted in any any way? No. Does that tell you anything? Was there any scuffle downstairs or any struggle that you can tell? 
there was a potted plant that was knocked over by the lighter that, that was knocked over by family members at the same time. Okay. Let's go upstairs. What did you notice upstairs? Uh, the, one of the rooms had some dresser doors that were open. It looked like there's some items and then ruffled through. Uh, the bed spread and bed clothing was askew. It kind of torn off the bed a little bit. Uh, clearly, Catherine's body in the bathroom that was handcuffed and lying on the floor. And then there was some clothing in the bowl rack, a hat, and then some other clothing in the bathroom. So, let me ask you a question. What, what is the purpose for uh, police officers cuffing an individual? Why do you put handcuffs on, on a suspect? To control them. To control them. Does it work? Yes, it does. So would you expect if someone's cuffed for there to be much of a scuffle? Not much. Um, we're talking, looking at States Exhibit 81, we're talking about that bed. You said the covers were pulled back. Um, can you see in this? Let me get this up a little closer. Where do you see that the covers are pulled? On the left hand upper corner of the headboard that pulled off. You, you can see the bare mattress. You can actually see that mattress, can't you? Yes. And looking at States 82, <coughs> when we get in closer, let me see if I can, this is kind of hard to focus on these blurry photos. What does it look like right here? With the covers are pulled off. So they're pulled back, aren't they? Yes. Does that appear like somebody being drugged back towards the other edge of the bed because those covers are being yanked that way? Yes. Now you said that you also noticed besides that, was there anything on the dresser or, or not stand or anything of that nature that gave you the hint that there might have been a scuffle? There was a part of the bed coach that might have been knocked off. In 83, but did anybody ever find that bed post that you noticed? I don't believe that's it on the front of the dresser, isn't it? I'm fixing it there, but I thought that's what that was. Where at? Right here? Yes, sir. You think that might be it? Yes, sir. Yeah, it's kind of hard to see, isn't it? With the way it's pixelated. Does that look like the same shape and size as these over here? Yes, sir. What about the bathroom? What did you notice in the bathroom? The shower curtain had been pulled down. It was lying across the, the rail the side of the bathtub. It had been pulled down off the wall. What does that indicate to you? Stroke. And when you look at uh, the autopsy, what did that indicate to you? As far as the bruising, the... There was bruising on her hips that appeared to be from behind as if someone were trying to control her uh, while assaulting her from behind. On her hip line with the period of fingertips. What about the other 30 something injuries? Injuries sustained in this struggle. Did it meet with what you'd heard from next door neighbors, or at least what you read about the next door neighbors hearing of struggle? Yes. With the fact that there was semen inside of her at the time of her death. What did that indicate to you as far as a detective? That she was sexually assaulted just prior to that. Did it appear to you that from your experience in uh, investigating these crimes, it appeared to you that she died other than anything other than a homicide? With A lot of this, there's uh, some testing that went on of certain items that were found at the scene, the crime scene. We had the comforter, had the towel, had the T-shirt, everything was, was, you remember all that being tested? Yes, sir. Now, there came up a question about a blue ball cap that was tested. Do you remember that blue ball cap? Yes, sir. Do you remember where that blue ball cap was? Did you did you see the pictures of it? It was in the door of the bedroom, lying with some pile of clothes. Was it right just... Uh, between the bathroom and the bedroom? It was.
ਤੇਰੀ ਹੋਇਆ Right, just like right there. Right here, maybe up close. Was this the ball cap, the blue ball cap? Yes, laying right outside the bedroom door there. Now, looking through all the investigation and all the all the things that uh, you read through, statements, everything else, did you determine where that blue ball cap, who that blue ball cap belonged to? Who did it belong to? Mr. Edwards, Captain Tall. In, as a matter of fact, in his statement to the police, did he tell them that he left his blue ball cap in there? Okay. And so that belonged to Mary Catherine Newton's father, is that right? Correct. And that's the blue ball cap that uh, the detectives are going to check out. That's the blue ball cap the detectives had tested to see who it belonged to. Now, at that point, had Mary Catherine's father passed away? Yes. Okay. So, The search warrant that you had to get the buckle swab. Later on, after things were being tested, did my office ask you to pick up some anal swabs from the lab and take them uh, from yeah you know, from the crime lab and take them to the Houston laboratories? And also some fingernail cuttings. Let me show you what's marked as State's Exhibit One Fifty Four. Do you recognize that? Yes. And what is that? The lab Swabs and beer shrinks. Okay. And looking at stakes to give it 33A, would that have been the anal swabs that were taken? Yes, sir. Okay. And looking at stakes exhibit 35, inside of 35, what do you find? Fingernail scrapings. And are those the fingernail scrapings that you took to? The Houston Crime Laboratory. And what date did you take those? They are in the tip of the May 11th of 23. And did you personally deliver those? I did. And when you did, were they in a sealed condition? Yes, sir. Did you pick them up in a sealed condition and take them in a sealed condition? I did. Interstates 154. Oh, is this your signature on Texas 154? Yes, sir. And it's not your handwriting because it's tight, but that is your signature. Yes. Okay. Interstates 154. Yeah. No objection. Yeah. One state's exhibit one fifty four is admitted. Okay. Well, let me go. Let's look at the rest of the Looking at state's exhibit 33B, do you recognize that? Vaginal swabs. And state's exhibit 33O, do you recognize that? Oral swabs. And did you at any time take these exhibits to the New Jersey and Huntington and Houston Crime Lab? Have you recalled them? Okay. Would you have put your initials on anything on these boxes? Mm -hmm. I don't think so. I think that was done at the actual autopsy. So if I would have gotten the this. So by the time you saw the anal swabs, these had already probably already been taken. Yeah, that's right. Okay.
Now, after the genealogical search, after your exhaustive investigation of what had already been taken care of, um, you traveled, y'all talked to Clayton Foreman, is that correct? Right. And then afterwards, y'all arrested him? Correct. Uh, arrested him out in the hallway there after he gave his statement, is that correct? Yes. And then you got the search warrant for the buckle swabs, is that correct? Correct. And you took those buckle swabs yourself? And just, I don't know if everybody knows what a buckle swab is, so let's, let's talk about a buckle swab. What do you, how do you take a buckle swab from someone? It's a big giant two tip you swab the inside of somebody's mouth and it collects cells from inside their mouth that gets packaged up in the boxes and sent for the one okay. It's a big Q tip you swab the inside of somebody's mouth and do two Q tips and then seal them inside of a box that comes with a packet. We need some to build that for testing. Okay, so those buckle swabs I showed you earlier, that's what you did with Clayton Foreman. And when you swab them, you place them in the box immediately. Is that correct? Correct. And bring them to the laboratory. Correct. I'll pass one, Jerry. Good afternoon. Nice. I'll be done. Well, Detective, I got some questions. What what date did you start when you pulled this case for as a cold case and started working on it? Originally, I looked at the, the digital images back in 2010. Okay. And when did it uh, start peaking your interest almost full time? In April of 2020. You testified that and um, you looked at the crime scenes photos and looked at the investigations. You would agree with me that the there was a report made during the investigation that the door were locked from the inside. Would you agree with that? The door was locked from in. from the inside, and they needed a key uh, to get in. So not not the door. Excuse me. There was a door that was locked, but it wasn't the door. Uh, where in your report does that reflect? It was not the door. Do you know which one? Yes, sir. Can you get it for me uh, after a break, please? Potentially, yeah. Well, to the station to get it. Excuse me. Probably like that to go to the station to get it. Well. We're here in trial today, detective. Okay. Um, so if another police report said that it was from locked from the inside, like a Texas Ranger, you would disagree with that. I would disagree that it was locked from the inside. Okay. You testified that it looked like to you that she must have known or trusted the person, correct? So that is a possibility. Okay. Was there any entries or was there any way to get in to that townhouse from the second floor? Maybe a window, right? But, right. Okay. But there was no sign they went through the window. Yeah. And during this during this this trial, we estimate, uh, would you agree that sometime probably in the early morning hours of one, two, two thirty, somewhere around there in the morning. This possibly had happened. Yes, sir. So that means that based on what you testified to, you believe that she opened up the door voluntarily. Without there being any signs of force entry, that is a possibility, yes. Well, you said that uh, you, 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 you testified that it was somebody that she possibly knew and trusted. Or trusted. All right. Yeah. Okay. Her bedroom was upstairs. Were there any bedrooms downstairs? Yeah. Did you see any struggles downstairs? Other than probably the plant that was explained away then. When you looked at the wall going up the stairway, did you see any marks like scuff marks or broken 
sheetrock where somebody might have kicked it in or punched it or that there was a struggle going up the stairs. No, I didn't. So you could take it from the evidence then that if the bedroom was upstairs and you testified to the pictures in the bedroom with the sheets and stuff, whatever that number might be, the pictures, so there, that there probably wasn't a struggle going upstairs. So was that a question? Yeah. Okay. No, not so then. Based on your investigation, that it appears that there probably wasn't a struggle going up the stairs. Yes. So if there wasn't a struggle downstairs and a struggle going up the stairs, then are you saying that they voluntarily or, or, or went back up the stairs after answering the door? I can't say whether she went up the stairs voluntarily or not. Well, and that's what I'm trying to, trying to get to. There's not, there's not a trick question here. You testified that there's no forced entry. You testified there wasn't a struggle downstairs. You, I asked you whether or not you saw anything on the stairway going up the stairway to the second floor that indicated a struggle. You said no. Right. So one of the other possibilities is, is that they voluntarily or she voluntarily had to have gone back upstairs because you're saying that she answered the door. That's a supposition on my part because there's no forced entry. But it doesn't also exclude the threat of force being on force upstairs. Okay. Supplement what? That she just voluntarily opened up the door and that then she willingly went up the stairs with whoever it was up to the bedroom? So that's not what it said. Okay. Well, explain it to me. That is one theory that she opened the door and was presented with someone that she knew or trusted either by okay. recognition or by the position of authority being this way. Just the fact that there's no force or no sign of disturbance going upstairs could also indicate that she was threatened to go upstairs. Threat of force. Right? She was threatened. And okay. was well, did you see anything that she was threatened at all to go upstairs? No, sir. No. And you weren't there. And you weren't even at the scene. Okay. So the struggle is in the bedroom. And in the bathroom, right? Right. And you, you testified that the bed and the sheets, it looks like it had been dragged off the bed. Uh, Left-hand corner, I think you said, right? Yes. Maybe I can get the picture of it. What'd you do with the photographs, Michael? I think what I figured. You just have. I know. I'll put them back in here, but once they go, it's was You put it back in. Mm -hmm. You put it back in. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure if you do. I'm
As he's looking for the, did you take them? <laughs> the picture was of the bed. You remember that? Yes, sir. And it looked like someone had been sleeping on the right hand side of the bed. Pillow was up. The, the, uh, the sheets were down. But on the left hand side, it showed the bare mattress. Yes, sir. correct. And I show you who what has been entered in. No, there's another one out there, but this means the uh, state's exhibit 81. Uh, is that what you were testifying about? Yes, sir. Would it appear to you at that time that whoever pulled those off, it looks like they got pulled off, right? This is uh, State's Exhibit 82. That they probably weren't handcuffed at the time. Because if you were handcuffed, you wouldn't have been able to pull those off, right? I would disagree with that. Not necessarily that they were pulled off by the person that were, was handcuffed. So you're saying that the person that was attacking did that? I'm saying that's a possibility. Well, it's also a possibility that the person that did it probably wasn't handcuffed either at the time. Possible. Huh? That the person who wasn't handcuffed did them? Yeah. Like, like if somebody, if she was in bed and they walked upstairs, okay, or whether it was a threat of violence or not, and they ended up in the bedroom, okay, because we know that, well, do you think that possibly she grabbed onto something to try to stop her from, from being handcuffed if she was on the bed at the time? Yeah. Or she could have also grabbed them while she was handcuffed. Huh? Excuse me? She could have also grabbed the sheets as she was handcuffed as well. Right. As she was trying to be handcuffed, right? Or while she was handcuffed. So she was on her back. Possible. Or she might not even have been out of bed. True. Possible. Possible. When you got it, you you testify, and I'm going to move on to something else for a second. Who sent the items to off ramp? Which items? Let's start with the first items. Uh, Mr. Middleton testified that there were some items sent for DNA designation, not genealogy or anything like that. Do you know what items were sent there? I believe it was cuttings from the uh, comforter and vaginal swabs. Okay. And that's it? That, I think so, yes. Okay. And after that, was there anything else sent back to them? Not to my knowledge, no. Other than what well, we would bring them DNA test kits for potential relatives. Okay. So what, what else did you bring to off ramp? in reference to samples to be tested? Some people swabs that we got from potential family members. Okay, and how many swabs do you think that you, just offhand? I don't remember how many, I want to say, we had roughly 39 or 40 people that volunteered. Okay. A vast majority of those were already people that tested commercially. So we didn't have to get people swabs from them, so maybe half of them. And then in addition to that, you had about another 40 other people that were possible suspects that you had to eliminate. There were 30 other samples taken early on in the investigation. You had some known samples, correct? Unknown, so while well, you had a known sample and you had unknown samples, correct? DNA? I'm not understanding. All right, let me let me take a step back. At the time of this incident, they took uh, uh, samples from Miss Edwards. Yes. 
specifically at the autopsy. One was the vaginal swab, correct? Correct. One was the anal swab, correct. And that was to see whether or not there was any evidence in their semen or anything like that, correct? Correct. And then they took nail clippings. Correct. And the pathologist talked about that nail clippings were were done for um, see if there was a struggle. Correct. What's your what's your take on that in reference to is that where a struggle may occur if, if there's anything under the uh, the nail clippings? Damn. Scraping, Damn. trying to fight defensively. Okay. And you took all that, you took all those items, you being Beaumont Police Department, and started analyzing them, correct? In the lab, yes. Yeah, through Beaumont PD. You got an unknown sample on the vaginal. This is the early infancy stage, right, of sperm. Okay. Well, is that right? An unknown sample? Right. An unknown suspect, yes. Right. And then, uh, same on the anal swabs, right? Correct. And then, how about the nail clippings? Those were tested later. And? Do you know what the results were? No. Did it lead to any suspects or anything? No. Nothing at all? No leads at all? And you exhausted every lead and every person that had come up in front of you uh, and made known to you, correct? Yes. Do you know how many people um, tested, let's just say, the vaginal swab before DPS finally tested it in 21? Do you know how many people? Yeah, how many, how many agencies? You had Selmark. I don't know who all tested what. I know that the FBI lab was involved in some testing. Right. Selmark, DPS right. Houston, DPS Austin. All cram? Yes. And did you ever use Sel Selmark? I think we have in some other cases, not this case, but in other cases. And used in prosecutions? Relied upon their results? Yes. And when you got down to April of 2021, it all pointed to one sub suspect, right? In the end, yes. And everybody else was ruled out. Yes. And all the DNA, whether it was known or not known, uh, was exhausted. Yes. Okay. There was a lady here by the name of Melissa Weber, who was a senior DNA analyst for Selmark. Do you remember her being called as a witness or part of the witness list? No, I didn't. If she was called, uh, would you be surprised? No. And she testified that she did some analysis uh, back I don't know, sometime in 1997, but specifically, uh, there was testing December 31st of 1997. You as the lead investigator for Beaumont PD, did you have a uh, chance to take a look at all the investigative reports, especially with DNA? I'm sure that I have. Approach, Judge. Go ahead. Doing what has been marked for identification purposes as defendants number four. 
Thank you. I will submit to you that this was given to me during discovery. Does that look familiar to you? The lab report from someone. And it was one of the reports that you reviewed uh, probably in your investigation? Yes, sir. You see any corrections, modifications, anything? There are a number of those that have been admitted before uh, already, uh, but it looks like all the other ones. There were many reports, were there not? Yes, sir. All right. Subject to any objections, Your Honor, uh, I enter in defendants number four. Thank you. I'm not Mr. Burbank, why don't you get that staple so it doesn't, you've got three different pages there, please. Yeah. So it doesn't. Actually, this, yeah. I start disconnecting. All right, without objection, defendants exhibit four admitted. Go ahead. This has to do, does it not, detective, with some blood that you sent to Selmark? Yes. It had to do with the Sandy Sandlin? Yes. And a Glad Hansen, correct? Right. And one of the big things during here, there's been testimony that there's some, some things that cannot be identified or DNA that is present that could not be identified, correct? Correct. And one of the things is a right fingernail from the victim with possibly scraping on it, correct? That no one could identify. Correct. And did you read the last sentence to the jury uh, in the report that was done by Selmark uh, by Ms. Weber? Lindsay Hansen cannot be excluded as a source of the DNA of Saints from the right hand footings. And that's the unknown DNA that no one could identify in the right fingernail footing. The scraping. Right? Yes. Tell me about Glenn Hansen. He was one of the people on the investigation that was given as a name for somebody to talk to. He can essentially give an example. Would you be surprised that that oh, it's like that? Do you know whether or not are there other DNA samples that have been not identified? in this investigation? I do not. Was there an unknown contributor male to the anal? No. Swabs, excuse me? No. There's not? No. You sure about that? Subject to recall, Your Honor, I passed the witness. Anything further? Go ahead. Two things. One, fingernail clippings. What and scrapings? What is probably one of the first things you could test for to see if, if somebody sexually assaulted you? Would it be fingernail clippings? Yes. What would you look for? Would you look for the semen? Yes. In her vaginal area and in her anal area. And if they match that person, that's the person that did was sexually assaulted, isn't it? Correct. Fingernail just means that she might have touched something that somebody else touched, and we don't know what that was. 
Was Hinson one of the ones that was tested for uh, DNA? Yes. Was he ruled out? Yes. So it's not really unaccounted for. It, it, he was ruled out of the semen and the and the, the vaginal and the anal semen. Is that correct? Yes. And from the comforted. So I wanted to ask one more thing about the handcuffs. I, I didn't ask you about the handcuffs. Did was there a search in this investigation to try to identify who purchased those handcuffs? There was. And what did they do? So that basically that's when the FBI got involved as well as well as some other agencies and sent out leads to a variety of agencies, both here in Texas and outside of Texas, to try and locate uh, where those handcuffs might be sold. And were they able to locate where they were sold? Yes. And were they agreed? What? Those handcuffs were manufactured in March of 1999 and shipped out in May of 1999 in a batch of 400 from Smith and Lesson to a company called GT Distributors, which now is an online law enforcement supply company. The serial numbers on those handcuffs are for quality control, not necessarily uh, item control. So they sent some people to Alabama, El Paso, San Francisco, really all over the place, trying to find uh, close matches to see if maybe they had the other set of neighboring handcuffs along that line to see if they could try and identify a suspect from there. Were they ever able to identify who purchased those handcuffs? No. Yeah. Or whatever happened to them? No. Yeah. Okay. I'll pass what he there, it's easy to blow off that that first thing first thing you look for is is in the vaginal and anal region, but the pathologist did, did you talk to the pathologist? I have. Uh, if there was testimony that said that there was a struggle and that the reason why she, he he did the fingernail clippings because of a struggle and because of scraping would probably give an indication of who that person struggled with. And, and it was the scrapings. It was. It w wasn't just touch. He he testified to, but actually scraping in a struggle. So, did you know about that? Do I know that it's possible to get? Well, you are talking about scraping jets. Well, I guess from the questions of, from the from the state is, oh, it's just touch. There was more testimony than just touch uh, from the state's witnesses. You weren't there, right? You weren't here because you couldn't listen to it. Right? Right. Okay. But if the struggle, and because there was testimony that because of what they saw in the autopsy and they saw in the pictures that she must have been struggling because no one would have put or agreed to put their hands behind, you know, for, for handcuffs, that that was relevant. And that's the reason why they took those samples. Correct? Disagree with the total study of that statement. Well, if the pathologist would disagree with that, or said something different, you disagree with the pathologist? I would disagree with it to the extent that there are other ways to struggle without getting scraped. Okay. So you go against what the pathologist says? I'm saying that there are other ways to struggle without scraping people. I've been contesting people for 26 years and I didn't get scraped. And, and the question still then is complete his answer. And the question that still is, is why didn't you what, know? You complete your answer. Yes, sir. All right, go ahead. Actually. Why didn't you know that there was an identification in those fingernail clippings back in December of 1997? There was not an identification. Just said that Mr. Hansen could not be excluded. Okay, well, based on that, did you then determine whether or not how, how they matched that? Because there had to have been DNA somewhere. Yeah. A DNA expert would be able to explain better on their, their what are looking for, their cutoff values, like, where they can actually call something. Like Melissa Weber? Sure. No. They may not even know there was a report with her name on it. And maybe even DPS, possibly. But you don't know. Sure. You're asking the right question. Well, DPS might not have known either, right? I don't know what they know. Well, there again, Detective, you were you, you're up there as the lead investigator. You went through all the things that you did, all the people you excluded, and these are things that I just had questions on. And why wouldn't I ask you? What I can tell is that Mr. Hansen wasn't excluded from that fingernail scraping, but he was excluded from the, the ceiling stains. Nothing further, Judge. I have nothing further to do. Oh, and this witness? 
Please. Excuse? Please. Sir. All right, you were excused, sir. And let's take a break, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, five, ten minutes, refresh yourself. And then report back outside. Everyone else remains seated while the jury exits first. And the witness is also excused. Thank you. Thank you. We are in short recess. Thank you.
And all parties are present. Please bring the jury in. Thank you. You want me to call that? Yeah, that's fine. Last week we stopped on Metalton and he and I'm calling him back. Frederick John said that the jury is seated in the courtroom. Okay, uh, we have released the last witness. I believe the defense. We did, Judge. Wants to call someone at this time? Yes, Your Honor. Uh, last week, uh, I had a David Middleton, Mid Middleman, Middleton. excuse me, uh, and we stopped because he had to get some information, and I'd ask that we called up, brought back in. He has a scheduling conflict. Uh, so I'd like to recall him. Okay. All right. Uh, no, any objection from state? No, Your Honor. All right. Um, is he close by? He's close by. Yeah, yeah he's right off top. Yeah. Middle one. And you have him on cross examination. Is that correct? That's correct, Your Honor. And please have a seat, sir. He was previously sworn, Judge. You are still on the road, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you. My police court. Go ahead. Good to have you back. Thanks. Uh, I'm going to show you again what has been uh, entered in the state's exhibit number 27, which is a report from your lab, correct? It appears to be. And the name of your lab is? Othram. Othram, okay. And that's from Othram, correct? It, it looks like a, a Xerox copy of one of our reports. Couple questions. Number one is, how does your company like to get evidence to test? I mean, is there a certain procedure that you require uh, in order to do the testing. Um, I, I don't know what you mean. Are you asking? Okay. In one of the submittal forms that I saw from your company, you requested, or there was, it was packaged in styrofoam and with cold packs mm -hmm. in it. Why is that? So what we what we do is we recommend to law enforcement when they send evidence to us, 
We want them, you know, we want the evidence to not be perturbed any more than it has to be. So we ask them to send it in the condition that it's been in. So for example, if the evidence was sitting in the room temperature, we'll say send it to the room temperature. If it's been sitting in the freezer, we'll say send it to us at you know freezer temperature. And if it's sitting on ice packs that presumes cold degrees. So we'll we'll tell them, you know, please send in the evidence in the way that you got it. Does it make a difference, for instance, if it wasn't cool or frozen, uh, does it make a difference uh, with the samples? Um, what do you mean by the difference? Do you think you're asking if the outcome would be different? Well, or something to do with the samples. I mean, does it deteriorate the samples or do something to the samples? I, I don't think it would have any appreciable impact, but I think it's just best practices. Um, it's never good to freeze thaw things. So, I mean, if, if something's been in a certain uh, condition, we, we just like them to follow the same condition they bring us. I think, I think people have worked with lots of evidence and stored it a variety of them. And so they can mix and match, uh, like it could be cool a little bit and not cool. Uh, I, I don't advise that. So if it's been sitting in the fridge, then we'll tell them, like I said, please send it to us at the temperature and the condition that you receive. If it hadn't been sitting in a fridge and then went to a refrigerator, does that have an effect? Um, no. Um, okay. I want to take a want you to take a look at that document there. Uh, in there, um, you said that there was presence of non-human DNA. Yes. Okay. You received at your facility a vaginal swab, correct? Yes. yes. And a clipping from a comforter. That is correct. Do you remember receiving any other samples? These were the two items that we received from the country. Okay. You did receive other requests to test the DNA for other individuals in this case, correct? For living human beings and yes. relatives, yes. Um, and non-relatives too. I mean, a number, there was, there was testimony that said that you received, or we sent over for DNA, correct? It's possible. Okay. I wouldn't know how to do the only thing that your company tested was the vaginal swab, correct? This report documents the vaginal swab in terms of how we built a profile of the unsub, the unknown subject in this case. Right. So it was only the vaginal swab that you tested, or you that you tested during this period of time. Oh yes. You never you never analyzed yes. or tested in any way the comfort. Um, no, we, uh, we did initial observation of both pieces of evidence. So sometimes law enforcement will send us two or three things and we'll say, if any of this productive is building a profile, and we'll do what we call a QC process, do a suitability analysis, and we'll say, is this good enough for testing? And so in this case, we were sending two items uh, for testing, but only one of them you know, really looked like a good fit. And so the one that seemed that it met the specs that we would need to be testing was item one. Which is the vaginal swab. And that's it. That's all you tested. That's all. Okay. And in your interpretation of the vaginal swabs, you did say that the presence of non human DNA can abet uh, adversarially or adversely, excuse me, adversarially, adversely impact genotype results, correct? And degrade the performance? Yes, it can make uh, the performance a little, a little tougher, it's a little harder to work the case. Okay. And, uh, Reduce matching performance, but will likely yield uh, a result usable by experienced investigative geneal genealogy practitioners, right? Yes. And, and the reduced matching performance is what we meant to uh, degrade performance. But there was presence of non human DNA in the vaginal. Yeah, which is, which is common, typically for cases that are decades old. Okay. Um, and then someone picked up the samples. Uh, from your lab, I believe it was, if they said April 19th of 2021, you wouldn't disagree with that? Yeah, the chain of custody log would reflect uh, when the officer came in person and signed up. Each time, if there was testimony that said you had this sample, and we know that you did the vaginal swab, each time they did send over another sample, blood, whatever it was for you to test, 
would it go against the vaginal swab that you tested or was it just DNA profiling? I don't know. Uh, there was testimony that that they sent many samples or individuals with samples representing mm -hmm. samples to your facility. What would you be testing for just to try to get a DNA number or I'm uh, doing it in a real simple term. Oh uh, yeah. So if, if if let's say an investigator meets someone and says, Can you help us in this investigation? I've got a big family tree and I'd like to see if I can essentially eliminate a big part of the tree. Then what we could do is we could do what's called an elimination. We're not we're not really looking at the DNA or learning from what the DNA other than to say we can exclude this okay. person in a sense. And that would be against the test that, that you did on the vaginal swab, it would be the against, results. Yeah, it would, be, it would be against the profile that we have generated from the plant solution. In this case, it's like one Other than that, that's the last thing that you've done. Um, There's nothing else. Uh, you didn't do anything after they took the samples from your facility in 2000, April 2021? No, the, the next time we were involved in this case, we were here. Thank you for coming back, passing it. Thank you. Let's make it clear. This was a really good sample, wasn't it? In states that one twenty-seven. Yeah, as, as I as I remarked in my earlier testimony. Um, we like to see, you know, fifty percent of the markers be readable, and 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 here we had, you know, almost ninety percent of the markers, eighty-seven percent you can see there. So this is, I would say, on the very high end of information. And then I just want to be more clear because a percentage is, you know, it's like what, what is eighty-seven percent? It, it's over a half a million markers. I mean, over a half a million data points that create a lot of certainty over, you know, who someone is and who someone is not. And, just to remind everyone, and, and sorry if this was an earlier testimony, but CODIS, for example, has 20 markers. So we've collected over a half a million markers. It, it represents probably one of the better profiles we've ever had. The we more cases that are very old, sometimes they're 100 years old. We have a person identified over, over 100 years old. So some of these are very tricky cases. This was not one of those cases. Thank you, sir. Now pass on. Nothing for and can this man be excused? Please, Jeff. Again. Again. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much, sir. Next witness, please. Tommy Dean. And raise your hand. And do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony that you are about to give shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? So help you that. I do. And please have a seat, ma'am. Thank you. How are you doing, ma'am? I'm doing well, thank you. And I'm just going to pull this down a little bit. Um, do me a favor and tell us who you are and what you do. My name is Tanya Dean. I'm a DNA section supervisor at the Texas Department of Public Safety Regional Crime Lab in Houston. And what are some of your responsibilities as the DNA section supervisor at the uh, Houston DPS Crime Lab? My primary responsibility is to manage a team of forensic scientists. I oversee their casework, output, casework expectations. I assist in their personal and professional development, approved time, normal supervisory type tasks. I also analyze um, criminal cases 
where I will examine evidence for the presence of biological material. I will attempt to obtain a genetic profile from those items of evidence and compare them to known reference samples from certain individuals. I issue reports on my findings and I attempt to find it for it. And um, this is, is this the first cold case you've ever worked? It is not. In fact, you and I have worked a cold case together before, haven't we? Yes, sir. Um, so tell me a little bit about kind of your training and education that qualifies you to talk about um, DNA forensic profiling. I have a Bachelor of Science degree in cell and molecular biology with a minor in chemistry from Texas Tech University. I have been employed with the Texas Department of Public Safety as a forensic scientist for over 18 years. During that time, I have gone through the required training program that is very intensive at DPS. We do a lot of reading. We do a lot of observation of senior analysts. We will practice on mock samples and eventually obtain independent authorization to perform um, both biological testing and genetic analysis. We are required to attend at least eight hours of continuing education a year, which I have done. And I also have a license from the Texas Forensic Science Commission. Okay. And you have, in fact, brought one of the uh, the forensic scientists un under your supervision here today to observe you. Is that true? She is one of my um, co-supervisors, yes. Okay. And so have you testified in court a number of times? I have. Have you testified in courts in our county a number of times? I have. Uh, and you have you testified in this specific court a number of times? Yes, I have. Um, testified in federal court? Yes, I have. Have you have you also gone to crime scenes? Yes. Uh, in what capacity do you go to crime scenes on occasion? When I first began my career at DPS, we did have a crime scene response team. Um, they disabled that in probably about 2018. But when requested, typically by the Texas Rangers, we would come out and offer our um, assistance and expertise in uh, crime lab and um, DNA type processing as it pertains to crime scene analysis. Okay. So you said that your one of your one of your responsibilities at the Houston Crime Lab or the DPS Crime Lab in Houston is to receive biological samples for com DNA comparison. Yes. And Explain to me what it is that you're doing when you're trying to make comparisons and how you go about that. So typically it's going to depend on the type of case and what I'm looking for. Sometimes we're looking for possible blood stains. Sometimes we're looking for possible semen stains. Sometimes we're looking for situations just where somebody may have touched something or come into contact with something. So based on the request and the case circumstances, uh, I might do some testing to determine if something is blood or semen. I might swab things, uh, take cuttings of items, and eventually send those on for DNA analysis. At the end of that process, I get a picture representation of the genetic profile from those items of evidence and also from known reference standards from individuals. At that point, then, I can do a comparison of those pictures to determine if maybe they're the same or similar. Now, those, those picture representations, are those uh, kind of like big graphs? Yes. Um, and what are those called? They're called electrophorograms. And we call them EGs sometimes? Yes. And do those, we've, we've, the jury has already heard from a number of uh, folks that work in your field in this trial, but are those usually representing the, the number of repeats at a specific location in the short tandem repeat. That is correct. And so when you get these charts or these graphs, they have peaks, right? Yes. And then you, as the uh, analyst, will then compare those peaks to see if there are discernible profiles from it. Yes. Okay. So tell me a little bit about your process for when you receive some sort of biological sample at the lab. What happens uh, when you first go to examine this uh, specimen? The very first thing I do after retrieving the evidence from the vault is I clean my work area. I'm always wearing personal protective equipment. I have my hair pulled back. I'll be wearing a mask. I have a lab coat. I have gloves. I make sure my area is clean and wiped down with some sort of a bleach solution. 
Um, and anything that I'm going to use, pens, tweezers, scissors, anything that I'm going to come in contact with, I make sure it's clean and wiped down. I will then lay down clean butcher paper. Um, and then at that point, I will begin taking out the items of evidence for examination one item at a time. So what, what's with these precautionary measures? What are you trying to avoid by doing these steps and taking things out one at a time, that kind of stuff? The importance of cleaning and wearing my personal protective equipment is to make sure that I don't contaminate either myself into the evidence or that I somehow contaminate previous evidence to the current evidence. We also only take one item of evidence out at a time to make sure that we don't have any potential for cross-contamination or mixing up two items of evidence. I mean, bef between the times that you would take, say, one piece of uh, biological sample out for uh, extraction, um, you would then clean your work area and then take a, a totally separate one out? Yes. Okay. Um, so after you do uh, have this, this clean environment to work and are able to examine a, a biological specimen, what do you do? So again, once I take the item out, it's going to depend on what type of analysis is being requested. I might look to do a visual search if I'm looking for blood, looking for red, brown staining. If I see some, I will then use some chemicals that we have to try to determine if it's possibly a blood stain. If it's semen, I'm going to put it under an alternate light source in the dark with special goggles to see if I find anything that could resemble semen. Um, if it's simply something where we get um, like a Coke can that may have been left behind by a suspect, at that point, all I'm going to do is swab it for possible saliva on the mouth of the can. So again, it just depends on what the analysis that's being required of that piece of evidence. So on the Coke can, the, the location that you would likely look for potential DNA um, from that swab would be where the like the saliva or the lips touch the can? Yes. What about where the hands touch the can? We don't get as much success from a touch sample as we do from an actual body fluid. So we might swab the can also, but we're always going to start with a saliva sample because there's much more DNA in saliva typically than when somebody has just touched something. Early on, uh, you know, kind of when STR testing first came into existence, um, some of the forensic analysts that have testified in this trial have explained to us that their fluids are always the most common look to source for potential DNA. Is that still the case? It is still the case. We have we advanced a lot in terms of, you know, what types of DNA we could potentially extract from other sources. Yes. Uh, but that being said, is the is it still consistent that, you know, fluids, blood, uh, saliva, things of that nature are always going to have a stronger profile available if there is DNA? Yeah. Okay. So, so after you look at this and inspect this item, do you perform uh, some sort of extraction to try and uh, extract any potential uh, material from that item that might contain DNA? Yes. Yeah. So explain to, them, explain to us how you go about that. Extraction is a very simple process where you add either a piece of the swab or a piece of the cutting into a tube. We introduce chemicals, a little heat, a little time. That allows the cells to open up, releasing the DNA. It goes through some sort of purification or cleaning process. So at the end, we're left with a very small amount of liquid that has our nice, clean, purified DNA in it. Okay, so is that called isolation as well? We refer to it as extraction. Okay. But um, it could be referred to that. We typically call it extraction. Meaning, it is the goal of extraction to obtain this biological material that might have DNA, but then also isolate potential DNA cells from, you know, other, you know, material that does not have any uh, interpretable DNA. The purpose at the end is to just have your nice, clean DNA. Um, at the ends and all of the cellular debris to be um, washed away. And is that where PCR comes into play? That's the next step. Okay, so what what is that? So the next step is one form of PCR, which DNA analysis functions under a Goldilocks principle. In order to get the best picture at the end of the process, you want to make sure you have just enough DNA. If I have too much then the picture looks terrible. If I don't have enough, I have an incomplete picture. 
So step two is a PCR process that allows us to count the amount of DNA that we have in our sample. The next step is where we do the actual Xeroxing and multiplying of the areas of the DNA that we specifically want to take a look at. And what are those areas that we want to take a look at? What are those, what do we refer to those as? Those are the FDRs. Okay, explain to us uh, what that means and, and why it is that those are so important in your field. So short tandem repeats are areas along the DNA that repeat in a sequence of four. So it could be four A's. And we're looking at how many times uh, a person has that repetition of four A's along that specific area of the program. I may have 13, somebody else may have 14, and th that's how we're able to differentiate one person from another. It is very important that we do make sure that with the exception of one locus that tells us male versus female, all the other areas that we look at in forensic genetics doesn't tell us anything about how the person will present themselves. It doesn't, tell us their hair color. it doesn't tell us their eye color. It just simply is non-coding areas of the DNA that are just highly repetitive and also highly variable. Okay. And so why why do you need to, you said Xerox, why does why do you need PCR to basically make millions of copies of these small segments of short tandem repeat DNA? Because even with a sample where you have a high amount of DNA, you have a very nice saturated blood stain, there is still limited amount of DNA. So you need to make more copies so that you can see exactly how, exactly what the profile looks like. Also during the amplification process, fluorescent, fluorescent tags get added to the areas of DNA and that is what leads us to our picture at the end of the process. Okay, so, and then when you said that there's these STR regions or, or loci, um, we looked at um, some reports from early 2002 from Cassie Carradine, I'll tell you what's marked as or admitted as things at 138. Here, um, is this referring to those some of those loci that you test as well? Yes. Um, they have these weird numbers and, and letters, don't they? Yes. Um, now, over time, has the number of loci that our labs are able to test increased? Yes. So what how, how many currently, uh, well, first of all, is it dependent on what type of kit you use? It does. Okay, so what is a kit and what is it used for? A kit is um, what is used at that amplification step, at that molecular xeroxing step. Okay, and so the kit that we're talking about that you used in this particular case, what is that? It's called um, Investigator 24. Duplex or something like that. And how many loci does that kit usually test? We have 23 locations that we look at. Okay, so that gets you above the threshold for what CODIS requires for profiles to be entered into like the FBI database? Yes. Okay. Um, Okay, so with that being said, um, then when you start to look at these SGR profiles and make comparisons, how are you? How do you go about that? The first thing that I do is I always look at my evidence profiles before I look at my known profiles. I don't want to be biased by what I see in my known profiles to then make maybe the wrong association in my evidence profiles. So the first step that I do is I look at my evidence profiles and I have to do what we call characterize it. Is it a single source profile, meaning there's only one contributor in this profile, or is it a mixture, meaning that I have DNA from multiple people? Um, and then at that point, I can put it into the software that we have and make our comparisons and get our statistical calculations. So this software, what is this called? It's called StarMix. Okay. When did your lab start using star mix around 2015 2016 before then did you have to do manual comparisons and do quite a bit of extensive math um, in order to reach any conclusions uh, about you know included profiles yes we did. um is star mix a the star mix essentially use analytics and data to repeat that same process? Yes. Okay. Um, and it, what what is StarMix most helpful for 
when you are trying to discern whether a profile is a mixture and how many potential contributors there might be? So we decide as an analyst how many contributors we think is in the profile and we input that into the software. The two main things that StarMix does for us is it helps determine which combination of this genetic information goes together. So it's most likely that this genetic, genetic information went to person one and this genetic information goes to per person two. And after that, once it's done that, if I have a known sample, I will tell that, I will tell the, the software to compare this known reference sample to the calculations it's done, and it ultimately will give me a likelihood ratio um, of, the, of whether or not the evidence could be explained as having come from that individual or not. Okay, so to this point, the jury has mostly heard about exclusions. Uh, what is an exclusion? An exclusion is when there is no genetic information um, from a, an individual in a genetic profile. Okay, so meaning that if you have a, a known and you have something to compare it to, that you are, the exclusion would essentially mean that the, the evidence, the comparing profile, it's excluded from being a match from this known. Yes. Okay. Now, what about inclusions? You said that there's a likelihood ratio. What is that? So the way we report our statistics is we compare how likely one scenario is versus another. So typically in a criminal case, it's going to be how likely is our person of interest, a contributor to this profile versus them not being or her not being. And then that gives us a number. The higher the number, the more likely and more supported the likelihood is that that individual, the evidence can be explained as having come from that individual. So what's a what's a high um, likelihood ratio? What's what's something that gets very high up when in the analysis that you've performed? So I can't speak to what I consider high or consider low, but I will say a likelihood ratio of one thousand and above does lend support to an inclusion. Okay. We do see numbers up to an octillion or a nonmillion, which is twenty seven or thirty zeros behind a number. So the, some of these numbers can get quite large, yes. um, billions upon billions upon billions. Cool. Um, but the, the minimum number that you need for purposes of being able to make a potential inclusion um, is what now? So 1,000 is the point in which we can say it is more likely that the evidence can be explained if it had come from our person of interest than if it did not. Okay. And... So I guess let me ask you if do you recognize what I've got marked here is uh, states one fifty one, or do you recognize what that form is? Okay. Is that a form that looks like it was uh, completed with the chicken scratch of a Brandon Bess, a Texas Ranger that we know? Yes. Yes. <laughs> um, and what is that? Uh, what is the date of that form? 4-19-2021. And are, are those forms uh, essentially the submission forms to your lab? They are. And uh, are those completed uh, at the time that the submitting agency or the submitting officer uh, brings that evidence uh, to drop it off at the lab and be placed on the vault. Yes. Um, and are they required to identify the specific items that they're submitting? Yes. Are those items typically inspected at that time? No. Okay, so if, if the item is received in sealed condition, it just stays in sealed condition until the specific analyst, such as yourself, would then be able to inspect the item? Yes. Okay. We'll offer 151. I don't have it. No objections to one fifty one here. It is admitted. It had been when I clear it up. 
looks like it had been tendered uh, by uh, yes. Ranger Best, but I don't have it admit, admitted through him. Right, Judge. We just, uh, to clear the record, make All sure right. that it's very clear. It is admitted, certainly now. Thank you, Judge. Uh, and also, before I begin, um, is the Houston Crime Lab or the Houston DPS Crime Lab an accredited lab? It is. Does that... Obtaining accreditation for the specific types of testing that you perform, is that a long and difficult process? It is. Um, and is that because the profiles that you do obtain, uh, many of which are reported to the FBI database? They are. And it's important to have uniform standards on how you know items of DNA are, are analyzed and profiles are developed for that purpose. It's important that the general public have faith in, in the work that we do and know that it is held to the required standards and they can trust and believe in the work that we do. Okay. Um, so let me show you on this state's exhibit 151. Let's show you what we've got marked here as state's exhibit 109A and its contents. You can look at one on one okay. Is that the correlating submission of evidence to states 151? Yes. Okay. Um, and could you take a look at the contents of 109? Do you recognize those items uh, or your initials on some of these items uh, as being received? With the submission uh, in states one to one. Yes. And, and what I'm referring to is states one nine A, which contains states one oh nine B and states one oh nine B one and states one oh nine C and states one oh nine C one. What is States 109B? It is the envelope that contained the vaginal swabs. Okay, and these would be the remaining portions of the vaginal swabs that were maintained by the Austin DPS Crime Lab uh, before they were sent to Author and you? Yes. Yeah. And what is uh, States 109C? This is the envelope for the comforter cutting. Uh, and that would that be the remaining portions of the comforter cutting maintained by the Austin DPS crime lab before they were sent to Auburn and then sent to you? Yes. Uh, did Ranger Best deliver these uh, in person? <clears throat> yes. We will offer, uh, what, did you open 109A and its contents um, and then begin to process these items for uh, potential extracting DNA? Yes. Um, and were they, it was 109A and its contents um, provided to you in a sealed condition? Yes. Okay. We will offer 109A. 109, 109C, 109C1, 109B, 109B1. No, okay. you're, uh, you're saying B is in boy, not B is in Victor. B is in Victor, Judge. It is B. They are labeled with letters corresponding to the nature of the sample. Right. Okay, I understand. Without objection, they are admitted. Okay. Shortly after, did you also um, receive some other items that I think may have already been admitted into evidence? Submission form for this.
Let me show you six one fifty two. Is this a, a submission form for a number of items from the trash pool? Yes. And de Detective Llewellyn bringing these items to the EPS Crime Lab for uh, analysis and comparison. Yes. And looking at some of these packages here, 113A through G, do these appear to be the items that um, were included within that submission? Yes. Okay. My medicine bottles. Okay. So, and did you receive these items in the submission? Yes. Okay. So, take me through, these are the, uh, what, what I just described here is uh, all of the states 113A through G, and then uh, states 109, 109 and its contents. Were those the first two su submissions that you received in this case? Yes. And when the evidence is submitted to your lab, is there a, um, a lab number that is generated? Yes. What was the lab number that was generated for this case? HOU 2104-06292. Okay. So when you received these items, tell me what you did as far as um, looking at them, inspecting them, and then uh, discerning whether or not there um, were any potential swaps that you take that might produce relevant DNA evidence. Based on the submission form, I knew that some spoons and dental floss and a plastic fork had been submitted. I knew that those were going to be my best items of evidence to start with because hopefully those had saliva on them, increasing the probability that I'd be able to get a usable profile. So there was uh, some like some medicine bottles and some envelopes and stuff like that. Uh, did you look to those first for any potential uh, DNA evidence that could be, you know, produced from them? No, I did not. Is that going back to the same kind of theory that we talked about earlier, that you want to look for places where there's bodily fluids that have, uh, you know, remained on that particular item? Yeah. Um, so were you able to look at some of the spoons and... Um, develop a profile that could be used yeah, I would. now how how would it be a what is this that you were going to use any profile that could be developed from these trash pull items uh, what were you what were you looking for specifically that would be utilized the two main things that i needed to obtain was one that it was a male profile and two that it was a single source profile okay so why are you looking for a male profile because the listed suspect was male and I was asked to obtain an alternate reference sample for a male individual. So what's an alternate reference sample? What are you doing when you're trying to obtain that kind of program? Typically for a reference sample, we want to know if something that came directly from that person. And typically it's either going to be a buccal swab, which is just a swabbing of the inside of the cheek, or it's going to be a blood sample. We know those came from that person. There's no doubt as to the source of that DNA. An alternate reference sample is a sample where they think maybe the DNA came from this person. They saw them drink out of the water bottle. They pulled something out of their trash. But we don't have the same level of certainty that we do from an item that came directly from that person's body. Meaning, meaning that you're when you receive these items, you're assuming that they came from the person that law enforcement explains they came from. Um, yes, I'm assuming it based on the information I have from law enforcement. Okay. And law enforcement would, you know, whoever was involved in that, they would be able to explain exactly where those items came from, how they obtained them, and how they got them to you. That's correct. Okay. So so when, when we're obtaining a, a reference sample, an alternate reference sample from these trash items, um, then what are we comparing that to? Uh, what is it that you're going to be utilizing these items to do? 
At that point, I had developed some profiles from the vaginal swabs and the comforter cutting, and I used the alternate reference samples to make comparisons to those items of evidence. Okay, so if we're talking about the vaginal swab and the comforter cutting, um, let's go with the vaginal swab first, 109B. Um, were you able to develop a profile for the vaginal swab uh, contained within 109B? Yes. Um, what was the, was it a single source profile or was it a mixture? So there were two profiles developed from this item of evidence, one from the sperm cell fraction and one from the epithelial cell fraction. Both of those were mixtures of two individuals. Okay, now I know the jury has heard this before, but uh, explain to us what sperm cell and epithelial cell fractions are. In a situation where we think there may have been a sexual assault, we go through a special extraction process to try to separate out the sperm cells from the epithelial cells. Sperm cells are very heavy and hardy, and so in a centrifuge type situation, you can actually pull those out of solution. Also, it takes a lot less uh, chemicals and time to open up the epithelial cells and release that DNA. So by doing a multi-step process, we can actually make an attempt to pull out the epithelial cell fractions from the sperm fractions um, and hopefully develop two different profiles. Okay. Now, when you develop these two profiles, generally speaking, is it common for the profile that contributed to the sperm to be much stronger in the sperm cell fraction? Yes, that again, please. Meaning the profile that the, the sperm cell fraction, is it is it common for, generally speaking, that profile to be stronger for purposes of the contributor to the sperm, meaning yes. the originator of the sperm? Yes. Uh, compared to, say, the epithelial cell fraction, um, would that sometimes be, would that, sperm, the profile that contributed to the sperm be much weaker. Yes. Why is that? Because again, the purpose is to separate out those types of cells. So you've got the sperm cells in one fraction and the epithelial cells in the other. So your hope is that you've got a lot of DNA from one person in one sample and a lot of DNA from the other person in the other. In an ideal world, you would have a single source from the sperm profile and a single source from the epithelial profile, wouldn't you? In an ideal world. Does that ever really work out like that? Very uh, Most of the time, it's some form of mixture, correct? Okay. Um, okay, so you were able to uh, pull a profile that was a mixture of two contributors uh, from this vaginal swab. Is that correct? That's correct. Now, what about the comforter swab, um, 109C? Were you able to develop a profile from that item of evidence? You know what? I'm sorry. I need to correct myself. The epithelial cell fraction from the vaginal swab was actually a single individual. Okay. And I, let me clarify too. From the, the sperm cell fraction of the vaginal swab, you had a profile that included two contributors. Yes. Okay. From the epithelial, epithelial cell fraction, uh, was it a profile that was ultimately a single source identified as Mary Catherine Edwards? Yes. Okay. Uh, now, what about the comforter from the sperm cell fraction of the comforter? It was a profile interpreted as a mixture of two individuals. Okay. Were, were these profiles compare or similar to the profiles developed from the sperm cell fraction of the vaginal swab? We don't do evidence to evidence comparisons, so I can't speak to that. Okay. So what you're looking for is a comparison to your known and the profile that you developed from that specific item of evidence. Yes. Okay. So, uh, there, but there were two contributors to the comforter sperm cell fraction as well. Yes. And what about the comforter epithelial cell, cell fraction? It is also interpreted as a mixture of two individuals. Okay. So, now going back to the, um, the items of trash, were you able to obtain single source profiles, male single source profiles from those items of trash? Yes. Um, do you recall which items of trash you were able to obtain male single source profiles from? Uh, ultimately, three of the spoons, I was able to obtain a single source male profile. And I'll tell you what, just so we can see what 
you're looking at here. Um, I'll show you what's marked as States Exhibit 156. You recognize what this is? I do. Is that your uh, report for the work that you did on these items of evidence that we've been discussing? Yes. Do you make that around the time or shortly after you perform your analysis and you know reach the uh, point of being able to compare profiles? Yes. And does it reflect your uh, opinions um, based on the evidence and the work you've done? Yes. We'll offer 156. No objections to 156, Judge. It is admitted. Okay, so let's take a look at this. Looking at states 156, is this what your uh, reports look like, ma'am? Yes. And if we go down here, um, we're looking at the, for this first item right here, we're looking at the sperm cell fraction of the cutting of the comforter from the scene. Yes. First of all, was there a sperm detected on that item? Yes. Do you, back then, were you performing uh, a test usually that included uh, an assessment of whether there was sperm present? Yes. Do you always do that? We don't anymore. Okay. Um, but if, if there was, uh, for example, um, a question whether or not there, a sexual assault had occurred, would that be something that you still are able to do? Yes. So you've got these, these known profiles from these items, from these trash pull items like the spoon, right? Yes. From that, are you able to develop a profile, an assumed profile or assumed reference sample for Clayton Foreman? Yes. Okay. And when you compare the sperm cell fraction of the cutting of the comforter to the known profile for Clayton Foreman from these items of trash, uh, what kind of conclusions were you able to reach? So the DNA profile from this item is interpreted as a mixture of two individuals. Assuming Clayton Foreman is the source of the spoon, the probability of obtaining this mixture profile if the DNA came from Clayton Foreman and one unrelated unknown individual is 96.1 septillion times greater than the probability of obtaining this profile if the DNA came from two unrelated unknown individuals. This likelihood ratio indicates support for the proposition that Clayton Foreman is a possible contributor to the profile. So there's evidentiary support for Clayton Foreman being a contributor to this profile in the amount of 96.1 septillion. There is evidentiary support that is 96.1 septillion, septillion times more likely um, if the DNA came from Clayton Foreman than if it came, and, and one unknown individual, than if it came from two unknown unrelated individuals. What's a septillion? Um, it's so that number would be 961 followed by 23 zeros. And did I ask you to assist in making some sort of chart that identifies how much it's a septillion is? Yes, and uh, I'm showing you what's marked as uh, states is it at 156a. Uh, is this an accurate uh reflection of the likelihood ratio for that first item of evidence in your report? That's uh, admitted as states 156. Yes. Uh, would it be helpful for the jury if they can see this and kind of understand uh, how big the number is that we're talking about? Maybe. We'll offer 156A. No objection to 156A, Your Honor. Admitted. <laughs> So looking at 156A, what's our what's our minimum threshold for a potential inclusion? So a likelihood ratio of 1,000 and above um, will offer support that the person of interest, the DNA, that the DNA profile can be explained as having come from the person of interest versus coming from an unrelated unknown individual. And what's the approximate world population? I think it's around 7 billion. 
And is that something that is incorporated into the data that supports these likelihood ratios or does it have anything to do with that? It does not. Okay. Um, but as far as looking at all the potential people in the world, we're talking about maybe seven to 8 billion. I believe so. And the likelihood ratio for the DNA extract of the sperm cell fraction of the cutting of the comforter is in the amount of 96.1 septillion. It is. Is that a, a large number of total world populations, um, basically times billions? I can't really answer that question. Meaning the world population, a trillion is like, what, a thousand billions? I think so. And so each one of those we would go out, um, meaning a quadrillion would be a hundred thousand billions. I don't think that's right. It is it a million billions? It 100,000 billion. Is it a million or is it a million billions? <laughs> I'm not 100% sure. I need pen and paper to like answer that. Uh, <laughs> well, I'm not going to make you do that. Yeah. Uh, but that being said, let's look at the next. Uh, looking at the DNA extract of the epithelial cell fraction of the comforter cut. What, what kind of conclusions did, were you able to reach for purposes of the epithelial, the non sperm cell fraction of the comforter? The DNA profile from this item is interpreted as a mixture of two individuals. Assuming Clayton Foreman is the source of the spoon, the probability of obtaining this mixture profile if the DNA came from Clayton Foreman and one unrelated, unknown individual is 2.49 septillion times greater than the probability of obtaining this profile if the DNA came from two unrelated, unknown individuals. This likelihood ratio indicates support for the proposition that Clayton Foreman is a possible contributor to the profile. So even in the non-sperm cell fraction of that item of evidence, the comforter, uh, there was still uh, some evidentiary support to link that profile to the assumed known for Clayton Foreman. There was evidentiary support that it is 2.49 septillion times more likely that the evidence that the profile came from Clayton Foreman and one unrelated unknown individual than if it came from two unrelated unknown individuals. Okay. And 156B, is that a, a, a diagram of the likelihood ratio for that epithelial uh, cell fraction of the comfort effects? Yes. And would it be helpful for the jury to be able to uh, understand how many numbers there are involved in all this? Possibly. Alpha 156. No objection. No. Admitted. So again, uh, we're still looking at likelihood ratios in the septillions, correct? That's right. Okay. Now, what about the the vaginal is that what is that the next item of evidence that you compare to uh, the single source profile that you developed from the trash? Yes. Okay, tell us about that. The DNA profile spermatozoa were detected on this item as well. The DNA profile from this item is interpreted as a mixture of two individuals. Assuming Clayton Foreman is the source of the spoon, the probability of obtaining this mixture profile. If the DNA came from Clayton Foreman and one unrelated, unknown individual is 213 septillion times greater than the probability of obtaining this profile if the DNA came from two unrelated, unknown individuals. This likelihood ratio indicates support for the proposition that Clayton Foreman is a possible contributor to the profile. Now, let me ask you this. At this at this point, from the items of evidence that you've seen, did you have a known for Catherine Edwards yet? No, I did not. Okay, so when we're looking at Clayton Foreman and this other unknown individual, um, ultimately, do you later uh, receive a 
blood evidence from the blood standard for Catherine Edwards, and you're able to kind of update your conclusions. Yes. Okay. But as we sit right here, we have Clayton Foreman and one unknown individual, um, which would later be identified as Catherine Edwards. Yes. And your likelihood ratios are, you know, for example, on this one, 213 septillion times greater than the profile being that of two unknown individuals. That's correct. Okay. And same thing with 156C. Is this uh, an accurate accounting of your conclusions for the star cell fraction of the vaginal swaps? Yes. And would it be potentially helpful for the jury if they were able to see these numbers? Potentially, yeah. And so was that uh, the sperm cell fraction of the vaginal swab? Was that the highest uh, probability ratio you had from these original uh, analysis and comparisons that you did? Yes. Okay. Does that make sense if there were a, a sexual assault that was committed uh, at the same time as the murder? Can't really speak to that. Okay. But looking at uh, for one fifty six C. Yes. Um, okay. I'm operating one fifty six C. All right. Without objection, it's admitted. So again, we're looking at two hundred thirteen septillions. Correct. Correct. Okay. So now. You go a little bit longer and you receive uh, some additional uh, items of evidence, do you not? Yes. So tell me about that. What did, what do you what do you next receive? I next received a blood sample from Mary Catherine Edwards and bubble swabs from Clayton Foreman. And if we're looking at what's been admitted as sex exhibit 153, is that the submission sheet for those items? Yes. And if you could, please, would you please take a look at 34C contains 34B, 34A, and exhibit 34. Do you recognize these items? Yes, I do. Is that your initial on uh, Exhibit 34, the, uh, the blood, blood sample envelope? Yes. What is this that we are talking about here? It contains within Sex Exhibit 34. There were blood tubes. And would you take one of these blood tubes and attempt to obtain a blood standard for that item of evidence? Yes. And then which one of those blood tubes did you get? I would have taken the purple top tube. Why do we take that one? The purple top tubes contain a preservative called FTA, and uh, that just helps keep the blood cells intact and helps decrease the rate of degradation. Okay. And when you received State's Exhibit 34C, containing 34A, B, and 34, was it in sealed condition? Yes. We will offer 34, 34A, 34B, and 34C. Without objection, Without objection, they are admitted. With that same submission, did you also receive another item of evidence? Yes. And what was that? Buckle swabs and Clayton Foreman. Show you what's marked as exhibit 118A containing 118. Do you recognize these items? I do. Uh, what is what is contained within 118? There's a swab box that two swab boxes with one swab each. Okay. And if you look inside this envelope marked with 118, do you see it? You swap boxes with your writing on them. Yes, I do. Does it uh, make you really nervous that I'm touching these with my uh, hands without gloves? 
No, because I have the cotton tip ends back at the lab preserved, so I can always go back to those rather than you don't trust these sticks. <laughs> uh, just preserve them better. Is that common practice for whenever you receive these swabs? What's a swab? Like? A swab is just like it's like a Q tip. Um, it normally, we'll have a long wooden end cotton on one on one end of it. So, is it common practice for you to kind of break the the Q tip end of these swabs off and retain them at the lab in the freezer? Yes. Uh, after your testing, yes. Um, so this is a lot of this is just uh, the original packaging of the items that you receive. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. Uh, but that being said, with uh, Exhibit One Eighteen A containing One Eighteen, did you receive this item in sealed condition? Yes. We'll offer One Eighteen and One Eighteen A. No objection. Admitted. Okay. So. Now, do you have knowns for both Clayton Foreman and Catherine Edwards? Yes. So what does that, uh, what are you able to do with those knowns that you were not able to do before? So one thing that I'm able to do is, one, I'm, I'm confident that the profile that I'm now using for Clayton Foreman is his profile. And then also I'm able to assume the profile for Mary Catherine Edwards on her comforter because she sleeps on it. There's a reasonable expectation that her DNA will be on it. I'm also able to assume her DNA to be on the vaginal swabs because it is an intimate sample from her body. At which point then I'm gonna rerun the likelihood ratios um, and generate a new statistic giving the software that we use that information. When when you go about that process, does it does having knowns help in creating strong profiles or does it hurt? Um, it typically it helps to have a, a profile from an individual that you can assume. What it does is it helps tell the software expect to see this profile in here, expect to see this genotype in here know that this this profile is, is in this evidence and then it gives the the software um a better chance of and with a higher probability pair up the alleles for that second contributor and it can be more confident that we know this dna came from this person it's extremely likely or unlikely that this dna came from the second person okay so if 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 your first analysis was accurate and true, then would you expect the, the likelihood ratios to potentially be higher uh, for those same comparisons now that you have knowns? Um, it, it could be. Um, that, that's certainly possible. So one of these items, um, 34, was whole blood, correct? Yes. And that was the blood from Catherine Edwards' autopsy. Or that's what you were uh, told it was. Yes. We've had a number of other people testify about what it was or wasn't. Uh, but that being said, how do you how do you uh, take um, you know a sample from whole blood that can be then you know compared uh, for DNA? The first thing I'm going to do is there are special cards that are made that also have preservatives in them. We'll put a couple of drops of that whole blood onto this card and we let it dry. Again, that's simply to maintain the integrity of the samples for any possible future testing. I'll then take a very small cutting of that dry card and then send it through the DNA process. And just looking at this uh, item right here, is that your writing on it? In red, yes it is. Okay. 6-23-21? Yes. Okay. So you take a, take a blood card and are, are able to develop a profile for the assumed known for Catherine Edwards. Now, what about from the swab from Clayton Foreman? How do you develop a profile from that? Just take a very small cutting. There's so much DNA on buccal swabs. You can take about a sixth or an eighth of the swab and then put it through the extraction or the, the whole DNA process. And then you develop a DNA profile at the end of that. Okay. So now you're, um, after you've received these new items of evidence and you've gone through your uh, intake of the items of evidence and amplification and separation, quantification, and all those things that we've talked about, do you then issue a new report with new findings? Yeah. And what are we comparing these, these nodes to? Uh, 
Uh, are they are the items that you're comparing them to still the comforter and the vaginal swab? Yes. Okay. And this right here. I'll show you what's marked as States Exhibit 157. You recognize what this is. Yes. Is that the supplemental report that you issued after receiving these new items of evidence? Yes. Uh, and is that report dated August 31st, 2021? Yes. Uh, is this report in the state's exhibit 157? Uh, is it made um, around the time or after, shortly after, you complete all your work and complete your analysis of these uh, new items of evidence? Yes. You will offer 157. No objection to one hundred percent. Admitted. Okay. So we're going through the same analysis uh, or comparisons as we were before, correct? Yeah. All right. So now we let's look at the first item on your uh, on your August thirty first report: the DNA extract from the sperm cell fraction of the cutting of the comforter from the seed. What conclusions uh, were you able to make from your comparisons uh, of this item? The previously obtained DNA profile from this item is interpreted as a mixture of two individuals with Mary Catherine Edwards as an assumed contributor. The probability of obtaining this mixture profile if the DNA came from Mary Catherine Edwards and Clayton Foreman is 444 septillion times greater then the probability of obtaining this profile if the DNA came from Mary Catherine Edwards and one unrelated unknown individual. This likelihood ratio indicates support for the proposition that Clayton Foreman is a possible contributor to the profile. So your likelihood ratio when making this comparison from the previous uh, samples that you had, it did go up, didn't it? Yes. Is that surprising to you uh, now that you have these knowns that you're able to um, utilize as for your analysis? No. Okay. Show you what's marked as 157A. Is that an accurate accounting of your conclusions for the DNA extract of the star cell fraction of the cutting of the company? Yes. Yeah. And would it be potentially helpful to the jury if they had this number um, or if they were able to see this to understand the number? Potentially, yes. 157A, we will offer. No objections, 157A. Admitted. 444 septillion, correct? Yes. All right, so what's our next uh, comparison? Are we now going to the epithelial fraction of the, uh, the comforter? Yes. Yeah. Okay. What do we got? The previously obtained DNA profile from this item is interpreted as a mixture of two individuals with Mary Catherine Edwards as an assumed contributor. The probability of obtaining this mixture profile if the DNA came from Mary Catherine Edwards and Clayton Foreman is 61.1 septillion times greater than the probability of obtaining this profile if the DNA came from Mary Catherine Edwards and one unrelated unknown individual. This likelihood ratio indicates support for the proposition that Clayton Foreman is a possible contributor to the profile. So again, your likelihood ratio increase um, from this, this analysis compared to the previous. It did. Okay. Um, all right, so now what about the vaginal swabs? Let's go to the first item on that second page of your August 31st report. DNA extract of the sperm cell fraction of the vaginal swabs from Mary Catherine Edwards. The previously obtained DNA profile from this item is interpreted as a mixture of two individuals with Mary Catherine Edwards as an assumed contributor. The probability of obtaining this mixture profile if the DNA came from Mary Catherine Edwards and Clayton Foreman is 461 septillion times greater than the probability of obtaining this profile if the DNA came from Mary Catherine Edwards 
and one unrelated unknown individual. This likelihood ratio indicates support for the proposition that Clayton Foreman is a possible contributor to the profile. Now, what about the epithelial uh, cell fraction of the vaginal swab from Mary Catherine What did you find there? The previously obtained DNA profile from this item is consistent with the DNA profile from Mary Catherine Edwards. There is an indication of at least one male contributor at the amylogenin locus. However, this data is insufficient for comparisons. So what's the uh, amylogenin locus? Amylogenin is the one location that's going to tell us whether it's possible male or female. So there was some evidence to suggest that there was a male contributor, but the data was not sufficient to be able to compare that to anything else. Correct. Okay. Now, we're looking at the epithelial cell fraction of the vaginal swab, correct? Yes. Um, so again, would that be surprising in uh, a homicide where a sexual assault occurred um, if there was a, a, a strong profile in the sperm cell fraction of a vaginal swab, but a weak profile in the epithelial cell fraction of the vaginal swab? It is not uncommon for the epithelial cell fraction from vaginal swabs to be single source or basically single source from the, the person whose vaginal swab it is. Meaning Mary Catherine Edwards. Correct. Okay. Um, but for purposes of that specific location, there is there is not enough for an inclusion uh, of Clayton Foreman? No, and in fact, there was enough to be able to say he's excluded as the contributor of the profile. Okay. Um, and then looking at the bottom here, what are, what are, these are just your reference samples, correct? That's correct. Okay. And... Looking at 157B and 157C, these accurately reflect your likelihood ratios for your other conclusions in that report that we want to talk about. Yes. And would they be potentially helpful to the jury if they were able to see these numbers uh, in bigger? Potentially, yeah. We'll offer 157B and 157C. No objections to seven and B and C. They are admitted. You analyzed more stuff too, didn't you? I did. Okay, so let's talk about that. When was the um, the next time you recall um, being asked to take a look at an item of evidence in this case? June 3rd of 2023. And what was it that we, um, or that was submitted to you then? The anal swab box and wooden sticks, and then left and right hand trigger nail scrapings and flipping. So I'm going to show you what is marked as state exhibit 33 D. Do you recognize this item? I do. Uh, is this the the swab boxes that you received um, from Detective Llewellyn uh, in that submission in June or May May eleventh of twenty thirteen? Yes. Okay. And the date right here is this reflecting the date that you inspected this item? Correct. Okay. Show you thirty three B containing thirty three C. 33B and 33, which contains 33O, 33B, and 33M. You recognize 33O, B, and A? Yes, I do. Now, were you asked to look specifically at the anal swab box, 33A? Yes. But when you receive an item of evidence, uh, can you document each of the items that you received? Yes. Um, states 33B and its contents, was it in sealed condition when it arrived to you? Yes, it was. 33A, is that the anal swab that you uh, 
Oh, the scale swab box that you open to look if, and see if there were any remaining samples. Yes. Okay. We will offer 33 A, B, and O. 33. 33 A, B, O. 33, 33 B, 33 C, and 33 D. No objections. Hold on. There's a B and a B, Judge. Say again. There is a B as in Victor and a B as in Boy. 33B is the vaginal swab box. 33B is packaging. All right, so we've got 33 A, B, and O. A, a V and O. Again, corresponding to the the right. nature of the sample. And 33. Then you have 33. B, C. You have 33 containing yeah. A, V, and O. All right. And, and then, then you have 33B as in boy. 33B containing. Containing 33. And then each of the outer packagings, 33C and 33B. All right. 33, 33A, 33B as in Victor, 33O. 33B, 33C, and 33D. Yes, sir. Admitted without objection. So, did you inspect the, the anal swab box to see whether or not there was any biological material in that box that you could uh, take a sampling from? I did. And that's 33A. What did you what did you find? I found that the box contained two wooden swab sticks with no cotton tips. The sticks clearly had been broken off on one end. And we're looking at these right here. Are these the sticks that are broken off? Yes. So there was no swab remaining inside this, this box right here, was there? No, there were not. Uh, so what did you do? So I swabbed just the ends of the sticks themselves, um, the broken ends, and then also the flaps on both ends of the box, just to see if there was any biological material that could have transferred from the cotton tips while they were in there um, to the, the box itself. In doing so, did you understand that this was kind of a long shot? Absolutely. Okay. Um, did you do anything with the other, the oral or the vaginal uh, swab boxes other than inspect them and them? No, I did not. Okay. You already had a sample from the vaginal swab that you had already done comparisons on. Yeah. Um, then you also received on 511.23, you also received a packaging from Detective Welland with fingernail prints. Yes. Okay, tell me if you recognize this. States Exhibit 35B containing clear plastic, packaging 35A, containing envelope 35. Containing two separate envelopes, step seven fingernail scrapings, right hand fingernail scrapings, left hand. Do you recognize these items? 
I do not recognize this. But I recognize what's this? Yes, for, I'm this sorry. Perfect of the record. That's 35 feet. Which for the record is described yeah, as is that that would be through her. That would she needs to answer that. 35B, is this the outermost packaging uh, that I of this item that I showed you here? You may not recognize this because it's from a different lab. Okay. I don't, I don't know if it, because I can't, I don't recognize it. I don't know if it's the outermost packaging to right. this. You, other than you, you, don't this have, you don't have a, an initial on 35B. I don't. You have an initial on 35, but they're plastic 35A. I do. Okay. And the manila envelope contained within 35A, I have exhibit 35. You have initials on that envelope. I do. And then for the actual scrapings that you have most contained within 35, you have initials on those items. I do. Here and here? Yes. Okay. So what you received was 35A contained 35, containing these two envelopes with fingernail scrapings. Yes. Okay. So tell me what you um, did for I tell you, I mean, did you receive 35A and 35 in its contents in a sealed condition? Yes. We will offer 35A and 35 and the left hand and the right hand straight was contained within them. And I might have to object because they were in 35B that you cannot recognize. Judge, 35B uh, was explained by testifying witness Steve Mays that it was a package um, developed or put on the scrapings um, at our local crime lab. All right. Your objection is overruled, and uh, they are admitted, and it's... 35A containing 35 and its contents and states exhibit 35B. And Judge, we will go ahead and offer 35B as well, um, although we could have offered it through Steve Mays. I've just admitted. Okay, so you receive these items, fingernail scrapings and an empty anal swab box. You explained to us that you attempted to develop a profile from the anal swab box. Was there was there a very strong profile that you were able to discern from the items in that box? I was able to obtain a profile from the swab of the box and the sticks. And uh, as you expected, was it not just a couple of contributors, but multiple? Um, it was a mixture of two individuals. Okay. Did you, were you able to ascertain a profile that could be compared from the swab of the interior of the sticks and the anal swab box? Yes. Now, was it a profile that compared to any of your existing samples or known uh, profiles? Yes, I did. Okay, so what was the what was the conclusions about the swab from the um, interior of that anal swab box? The DNA profile from this item is interpreted as a mixture of two individuals with Mary Catherine Edwards as an assumed contributor. Based on the likelihood ratio results, Clayton Foreman is excluded as a contributor to this profile. Okay, so how are you able to discern a number of different lab numbers and markings on this box from over the years? 
I can tell by all of the markings and the writings that um, several people came into contact with this box. I don't know whether they were labs or medical examiners or law enforcement, but it does appear to have several people's initials on it. And is it a is it a possibility that that unknown profile in the anal swab box um, would have been one of those individuals that had touched them over the years? That's possible. We're talking about over 20 to 30 years worth of this box going from one place to the other. Um, is that within the realm of forensic possibility? It is possible. Okay. Now, as you later um, obtained the last portion, the very last portion of the original anal swabs, do you not? I did. Um, now, that was not an exclusion of Clayton Foreman, was it? Um, I did run a likelihood ratio that um, did indicate support for the proposition that Clayton Foreman is a possible contributor. Okay, so how, uh, when we'll get to that in just a second, but how do you reconcile the swab box for the anal swab it being an exclusion for Clayton Foreman, but the actual swab uh, being an inclusion or there is support for the proposition that he is a contributor to it? There are a lot of possibilities as to how DNA could have gotten onto that box. Again, it went through a lot of different hands. A lot of different people opened it and closed it. Um, so just over the years, it just could have been exposed. In the, the early 90s, in the early 2000s, um, DNA was just in its infancy. Precautions weren't being taken by medical examiners and law enforcement personnel like they are now. They know to wear gloves. They know to wear masks. They understand the sensitivity of DNA analysis. That wasn't very well known in the early, in the, the 90s and the early 2000s. Um, so it's just possible that it could have happened that way. There's a very sundry of reasons and, and things that could have happened. Did I give you a... Oh, I think I put it in let me go through this last time. Um, later, uh, about a month or so later, um, did myself and Ranger Brandon Bess uh, work with the Austin DPS crime lab, uh, specifically this DNA section head there, Allison Hurd, to locate the original remaining samples of Catherine Edwards' anal swab? Yes. And do you recall? Ranger Bess coordinating to pick these, uh, pick that last sample from the anal swab up from the Austin lab and transport it directly to your lab in Houston. And I'm showing you what's been admitted as six exhibit 155. Yes. And do you recognize what we have marked here as states exhibit? 110, 110A, 110 containing 110A, containing item uh, exhibit 110. Yes, I did. Did you receive 110A, one? 110B, 110A, and 110 in sealed condition? Yes. Hold on. 110B is just showing up all of a sudden. You're going to have to start on. Oh, we, you, you repeated 110 twice. I did, Judge. Um, one, let me ask you this. 110A, did you create this? And, and let me ask you this. Uh, let me re-ask it a different way. Um, did I ask you to uh, repackage the remaining portion of the anal swab so that you could send us the packaging for this item uh, to be used at trial? Yes, you did. Um, and did you, in doing so, have to um, package uh, the swab inside of 110A or the states 110 inside 110A? No, 110A, I had it 
when I did the original analysis in July of 2023. Awesome. So I think that it came like this from Austin. It just wasn't labeled by anybody. I see. From and them. the packaging that came from Austin was 110B. I think all three of those items came from Austin. This just didn't have any initials from anybody in Austin. When we package our cuttings, they go in a plastic bag also that don't have any <clears throat> documentation from us. So that could be what happened in this case is that's just their normal storage practice to put them in a plastic bag and they don't they don't label them because the inside envelope was properly labeled. And, and I misspoke when I asked that because I in 110B and all of its content, oh, is okay. that what you received from Austin DPS Lab? Yes, it was. And do you recognize Allison Hurd's initials on the top of this? Uh, I don't work with her. I wouldn't know for sure. I don't want to say yes. Okay. I don't know. Do you, is this appear to be the Austin DPS Lab number? Correct. They have L numbers, right? They did um, when this case was first brought to them. We don't change lab systems or lab information systems a number of times since then. Yeah. Uh, but that being said, is this what you received, 110B and its context uh, from Texas Ranger Brain and Best in person delivery? Yes. And when did you receive that? That was on June 16th of 2023. And does it appear as though there's uh, some tape with some initials the day before that uh, on this out of packaging? Yes. And 110B and its contents, 110A and 110, did you receive those in sealed condition when uh, Texas Ranger passed over? Yes. Okay. We will offer 110B, 110A, and 110. No objection. Admitted. Okay. There's um, the last item of evidence that you received in this case. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. So let's talk about what you were able to uh, discern from these items. Um, did you prepare a report after you received these supplemental items of evidence? Yes, I did. And is that report dated July 25th, 2023? It is. And I'll show you what's marked as State Exhibit 158. Does that appear to be a true and uh, correct copy of your report? It is. It is that report made around or shortly after the time that you complete your analysis and uh, complete your work? Yes. We will offer 150. No objections to 150 days. Admitted. Okay, so then let's talk about your July 2023 report. So uh, for purposes of the knowns here, are you indicating on this first page that you're still using the profile from the buccal swabs from Clayton Foreman as a known? Yes. Right? And you're still using the blood card that you prepared from Catherine Edwards' blood as a known? Yes. Okay, so... First of all, let's go to the, the anal swap box, that first uh, item there. What were what were your um what was your opinion in that uh, particular item? The DNA profile from this item is interpreted as a mixture of two individuals with Mary Catherine Edwards as an assumed contributor. Based on the likelihood ratio result. Clayton Foreman is excluded as a contributor to this profile. Okay, so that's what I was asking you about before, um, because once you receive the actual swabs, um, you do have an inclusion, correct? I have a likelihood ratio that indicates support for the proposition that Clayton Foreman is a possible contributor. Okay, and let's see here. Let's go down to... We'll skip a couple down. Is that the uh, opinion in your report about the sperm cell fraction of the anal swabs? That's correct. And again, you're talking about the item that you received in States 110? That's correct. Okay, so tell, tell us what you uh, found from that item. The DNA profile from this item is interpreted as a mixture of two individuals with Mary Catherine Edwards as an assumed contributor. The probability of obtaining this mixture profile 
if the DNA came from Mary Catherine Edwards and Clayton Foreman is 15,600 times greater than the probability of obtaining this profile if the DNA came from Mary Catherine Edwards and one unrelated unknown individual. This likelihood ratio indicates support for the proposition that Clayton Foreman is a possible contributor to the profile. Now, 15,600 times greater for the likelihood ratio, that is a ratio that is not in like the septillions, correct? That's correct. Um, but that being said, um, what are, when we're looking at the sperm cell fraction of the anal cell, what are some potential explanations from a forensic standpoint for why there might be a stronger profile developed from the sperm cell fraction of the vaginal swabs compared to the sperm cell fraction of the anal swabs? Basically, it comes down to that there's less DNA from that male contributor on this item than there was on the vaginal swab. That could simply be that um, ejaculation didn't occur in the anal area. Um, it could be that um, there wasn't any sort of anal penetration. Um, but how the DNA got there, I can't really speculate to that. But what I can say is there is less of his DNA or this this foreign contributor DNA on the anal swabs and the sperm fraction than there was the vaginal swabs. But there is a support for the prop proposition that Clayton Foreman's DNA was found in the rectal swab or the anal swab. That he is a possible contributor to the profile, yeah. Okay. Um, and so if, if um, this contributor, Clayton Foreman, had, say, ejaculated vaginally, but then sexually assaulted Catherine Edwards anally, would that be one possible explanation for why the profile um, or the likelihood ratio might be different from the sperm cell fraction of the vaginal swab compared to the sperm cell fraction of the anal swab? That's one explanation, yeah. Is, um, well, let me ask you this. The epithelial cell fraction, the non-sperm cell fraction uh, from the anal swab, what did you find there? A single source profile? Yeah. And the DNA profile is consistent with the DNA profile from Mary Catherine Edwards. Okay. Now, what about the fingernail clippings? Going back up here a little bit. Did you uh, attempt to extract DNA from the right hand and left hand fingernail scrapings of Catherine Edwards? Yes, I did. And what were your findings uh, pertaining to the DNA extract of the swab of the left hand fingernail scrapings uh, and clippings from Mary Catherine Edwards. The DNA profile from this item is interpreted as a mixture of two individuals <clears throat> with Mary Catherine Edwards as an assumed contributor. Based on the likelihood ratio result, Clayton Foreman is excluded as a contributor to this profile. And what about for the, the same for the right hand fingernail scrapings and clippings from Mary Catherine Edwards? The DNA profile from this item is consistent with the DNA profile from Mary Catherine Edwards. Okay, so the right hand was a single source, um, whereas the left hand was a mixture, but Clayton Foreman is excluded. That is correct. Now, let me ask you this. Uh, from a forensic standpoint, if Catherine Edwards was found um, hand with her hands handcuffed behind her back, um, from a forensic standpoint, would that potentially be a reason why she would not have um, a lot of foreign DNA under her fingernails? Objection here on what she knows for a fact of how God there. I am Jeff. All right. Um, let's see what her answer is. That is a possibility. If there was not enough time for the victim to come into physical contact with the suspect, whether it be she was bound or there was a weapon that subdued her, um, it's possible that she would not have the opportunity to collect any foreign DNA under her fingernails from her assailant. So assuming assuming the scenario that I've described where Catherine Edwards was handcuffed, um, would that be a possible explanation for why there might not be um, a foreign, pro, foreign DNA profile on the right hand and a, there is, but Clayton Foreman would be excluded on the left hand. That is a possible explanation. Okay. 
Now, did the the thresholds for um, the likelihood ratios in this last item here um, present you with a, I guess, an opportunity to conduct an additional type of testing? Yes. Okay, so what type of testing was that? On the anal swabs, we, uh, I conducted what is called YSTR typing. So what is YSTR typing and how does it differ from this, this STR typing that we've been talking about? YSTR typing looks at the genetic information on certain locations only on the Y chromosome, which only men have. It is ideal to use in situations where there's so much female DNA that we can't really pick up or see the male contributor in um, a sample. And so due to the low level of that second contributor or that male contributor on the anal swab, I decided to utilize this technology to see if I could obtain a YSTR profile on the anal swab. The reason why we don't start at YSTR profiling is um, DNA is unique to each individual except for identical twins, um, which is why we always like to start there first because we can normally tell one person from another. YSTRs are inherited along the fraternal line. So if I ran the, the YSTR profile from my father-in-law, my husband, and both of my sons, they're gonna be completely the same. You can't differentiate between who may have left the DNA based on the profile itself. Um, but it can be helpful when there is so much female DNA that we can't really detect that male DNA in our traditional testing. Okay, so when you have that that weaker male DNA profile, um, it gives you an opportunity to look at the at each one of the loci that the male DNA is located at. Yes. Okay. And in doing so, did you prepare a a, a report with your findings about the? Y star analysis. I did. And is that uh, report reflected in State's Exhibit 159? It is. Um, is that State's Exhibit 159? Is that made uh, around the time or shortly after you uh, complete your work and analysis? Yes. We'll offer 159. <laughs> No objection to 59, Judge. It's admitted. 159? 159. 159 is admitted. 59. Ms. Dean, uh, so let's take a look at your final report here. Um, were you able to obtain a Y star profile for comparison? Yes. And what were you comparing? Um, the profile, the Y star profile is developed from the sperm cell and epithelial cell fractions of the anal swabs? Yes. And not the anal swab box, correct? But the actual swabs that you uh, obtained from Austin? Yeah. Okay. That's one tip? Yes. Okay. And what, what kind of conclusions did you reach um, for purposes of the sperm cell fraction of the anal swab? Before I start reading this, I would like to ask, do you want me to read every location? No. Um, in fact, I, I would prefer if you didn't. Um, and just explain that each one of those uh, numbers and letters in sequence there, are those a a, a loci or a location um, on the male DNA sequence that you were looking at? That's correct. Those are specific locations along the Y chromosome that we're looking at. That's all those are. And so as to those specific locations, what, what were your findings? The partial Y STR profile from this item is interpreted as originating from a single individual. Clayton Foreman cannot be excluded as a contributor of the male DNA profile, the following loci. At these loci, the selected profile is found in zero of 16,388 total individuals within the database. In addition, any paternally related male relatives of Clayton Foreman may not be excluded as the contributor of this male profile. So are you taking the, the known 
profile from Clayton Foreman's buccal swabs and comparing it to the profile, the profile profile of male DNA at each one of those locations? I did have to generate a Y STR profile from the buccal swabs for Clayton Foreman. And then I used that profile to do a comparison to the Y STR profile from the AM swabs. I see. And there is is there a little bit different of a process for generating a Y STR profile from Clayton Foreman's buccal swabs? It's just amplifying with a different kit. Okay. Uh, and after you had that profile and you were able to compare it to the male DNA at each one of those locations, and your finding is that Clayton Foreman was, cannot be excluded. That's correct. Okay. Um, does Y star have likelihood ratios and probabilities um, available whenever you are in your reporting, or is it that the person cannot be excluded um, is really the only conclusion you're able to make? Well, there is a database that we use, um, we we're using at this time, and I did enter that partial profile into that database to see how many times that profile had been seen in that national database. It's a simple counting method, and at that point, as of July 25th of 2023, it had been seen zero times out of 16,388 total individuals within the database. Okay. This is this is not necessarily a new type, of, a new concept, but it is a, a more recent type of testing that has been utilized in yes. DNA analysis? Yeah. Okay. So, and then what about the epithelial uh, cell fraction of the animal swaths of Mary Catherine Edwards? The partial Y STR profile from this item is interpreted as originating from a single individual. Clayton Foreman cannot be excluded as a contributor of the male DNA profile at the following loci. At these loci, the selected profile is found in zero of 16,388 total individuals within the database. In addition, any paternally related male relatives of Clayton Foreman may not be excluded as a contributor of this male DNA profile. Okay. So was there any other additional testing that you performed in connection with this lab number? No. And the, um, ultimately comparing the, the knowns to the vaginal swab and the knowns to the comforter cuttings, um, would you agree that there is evidentiary support that Clayton Foreman was a contributor to those profiles? I would agree that there is, there is evidence of the proposition that the evidence can be explained as having come from Clayton Foreman and Mary Catherine Edwards versus Mary Catherine Edwards and one unrelated unknown individual. And that the evidence supporting that proposition is in the septillions uh, on some of your analysis. Yes. No further questions. It's gonna be a while. We're gonna take a break for the night. Oh, can all of you return back at nine o'clock? Nine o'clock. Please remember the instructions that was given to you. You want to see you back in the morning. Thank you. Have a nice evening. Everyone else remains seated while the jury exits first, please. Thank you. And we are in excess. Thank you.